Yeah, it works for me. Sorry, Francesca, are you expecting me to kick off?
Hello and welcome back for the afternoon session of the 2021 Euro Conference on Regulating Uncertainty. It's my pleasure to welcome you back and for the last two panels of this conference and of the day. The first one will address the issue of when to regulate um, and we'll have a quite diverse panel encompassing lawyers and economists to discuss the topic and then the later panel, the fourth panel, will be on AI in and versus global challenges. So without any further ado, welcome here with us again. I hope we will again have a very fruitful discussion following the same criteria that we followed until now. That basically is um, first the panelists will present uh, uh, their papers and then there will be room for debate. You as attendees can participate by raising questions and we very much encourage that on the chat and we will manage the questions in the discussion part um, uh, by reading them out to the speakers. So uh, for the first panel, I invite my colleague, uh, 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 Arianna Martinelli, who is an associate professor of economics here at the Scuola Sant'Anna, to, 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 to take the lead of the panel and, uh, and drive us through this very interesting debate. So, good to have you here. Okay, um, welcome to everybody. And, uh, well, as uh, Andrea rightly pointed out, I'm, a, I'm an economist, so actually I'm uh, delighted to be chairing this uh, session because, as you might know, economist uh, tends to be refrained from regulatory intervention and accepting regulatory interventions in very specific cases and under very specific circumstances. So, however, the disruptive potential of AI, and in particular, um, its wide applications, which might not be fully expressed uh, yet, uh, represent a, ca a case in which uh, uh, we might start to think about uh, what can be the consequences of such a disruptive technologies on, uh, and therefore to start wondering about uh, uh, regulations and what are the rooms of uh, uh, potential interventions. However, besides this question, regulation, yes or no, of course, uh, uh, there are other issues that are quite important for the effectiveness. And one for sure is when to regulate. So the timing of uh, uh, regulatory intervention is pivotal in uh, having like the uh, desirable outcome. And um, so I'm very glad to chair these sessions with uh, such a distinguished speakers, especially because uh, um, the panel is rather inter interdisciplinary. So we have law scholars, economists, and <clears throat> practitioners. So I think it's a very excellent mix to discuss uh, such a complex and interesting uh, topic. So um, the first uh, speaker is uh, Professor Bronsworth, professor of uh, law and, uh, at King's College and at Bournemouth University. The second speaker will be Elisa, uh, Professor Elizabeth Fisher, Professor of Environmental Law uh, at Oxford University, who will present a paper that is co-authored together with Pasqui Pasquale and Wendy Wagner. As the third speaker, we will have an economist, so Kuhn Franken, Professor Kuhn Franken, that is full professor uh, in innovation studies and chair of innovative studies at the Copernicus, Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development at Utrecht University. And finally, Norberto Andrade, who is a face, uh, Facebook's global policy lead for digital and AI ethics and professor at uh, EA Law, uh, school, uh, Law, Law School. So, each speaker has about 20 minutes, and um, eventually I apologize in advance if I have to exert my right as a chair to try to keep you on time and maybe I have to um, interrupt you. So uh, I leave the floor to Professor Bronsworth for the first uh, uh, presentation of this uh, afternoon session. So the floor is yours. Huh? Well, thanks very much indeed. And um, <laughs> thanks for the invitation to to speak at this workshop or conference. Um, yeah, well, in the last year or so, we've heard politicians saying frequently that they'll be taking the right measures at the right time. Um, this is in the context of the restrictions um, in relation to COVID, um, but it's very important always that they tell us we're doing the right thing at the right time. And uh, we are familiar with these mantras too, 
in the context of emerging technologies where regulators are keen, again, to make the right kind of regulatory interventions at the right time. Um, but when we press on what this precisely means, we, we don't make a huge amount of progress, I think. Um, uh, the right measures, well, people will say we don't want to over-regulate, we don't want to stifle innovation, we don't want to miss the target, um, but particularly we don't want to stifle innovation. So the technology constituency is very keen on not over-regulating, um, but uh, conversely, we don't want to under-regulate either and leave consumers or data subjects or others at risk or the environment being put at risk um, or our basic values being compromised. So it's a kind of delicate balance between uh, either over-regulating nor under-regulating. Uh, and the same goes with the, the mantra about regulating at the right time, because if we say, well, what, what, what is the right time? Well, then neither too early nor too late. Uh, we regulate too early, rather like if we over-regulate, the, the fear is that this will stifle innovation or where there's going to be innovation and investment in innovation, it won't be in our particular jurisdiction because we're just over-regulatory and very early on the case. Um, but equally, of course, um, if we're too late, then the danger, um, as David Collinridge pointed out many years ago, is that things have got to a point where actually, although you would like to qualify or reverse this particular technological development, it's now very difficult to do. It's become, in practice, difficult to, to go back. So, yeah, okay. So in both cases, we're talking about the kind of being a sweet spot somewhere in the middle where we have neither over-regulation nor under-regulation and it's regulated exactly at the right time. But what more can you say? Um, and even though I've been thinking about questions like this for a very long time, uh, it's quite tricky to, 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 to say much more than I've said in a very general way, except then to move on to rather particular cases where we're going to have further analysis of what the risks and profiles seem to be. But I think there, is, there are some things you can say other than these generalities and, uh, which, uh, with which I've started. Um, and I'm going to try and focus on one, just what, there are many things actually, but just one of them, one big thing I want to try to say today, but to frame the way we understand these questions, where these questions are located in our larger scheme of thinking. Um, so uh, the context in which we um, encounter this uh, enjoinder to have the right regulatory measures in place at the right time, typically is a context where there are new technologies coming onto the radar. Uh, I mean, whether this is back with human genetics 25, 30 years ago, or whether it's with AI and machine learning and blockchain and the things that are in the spotlight now, makes no difference. The, uh, the debate is, on the one hand, advocates, you know, uh, supporters of this technology, warning about you know, regulation being too heavy and oppressive and stifling, what could be potentially very beneficial innovation. So. You know, of course, the benefits are always being talked up there. This is at the, the, you know, the top of the script for those who are promoting these technologies, the benefits, and, and particularly the benefits in health, or less so I'd say in criminal justice, but particularly benefits in health, uh, the public is very receptive to that kind of script. Uh, so, uh, but then there's pushback against this. There would be many voices in many cases saying, hang on a minute, you know, even if we buy what you're saying about these benefits, there are risks. Uh, uh, and, and there are preferences and priorities, and we don't all see it the same way. But there are particular risks to human health and safety. You know, we like the idea of autonomous vehicles, maybe, but uh, are they going to be safe? Um, we like the idea of vaccines, but are they going to be safe? Yeah, there's health and safety concerns, there are environmental concerns. There are concerns in communities that are committed to human rights and human dignity about some of their fundamental values, the whole raft. Of concern. Oh, some people just very nervous about it, don't like the idea they're habituated to a particular way of life, and particularly if, as with AI, the you know, there's going to be economic and social disruption, which means jobs will be lost, and you know, people will have to find new, 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 new places to, to be employed. Uh, then, then it's disturbing. So, so you've got then this promotion of the technology. Uh, and that's being pressed on regulators to you know, hands off, light touch. Uh, uh, and on the other hand, you've got pushback against it, which is going in the opposite direction. And this typically now becomes very messy because, I mean, this is just politics. 
uh, you can have ethics in the, in the frame as well, but it really is just politics. And it's messy, it's accommodation of different stakeholders with different interests. Um, and uh, we shouldn't have too high expectations here. But this is precisely where we do say, oh, we have to have the right regulatory measures in at just the right time. Uh, well, okay, I, no, no doubt that is the ideal, but uh, guiding regulators as to what exactly is the right time when there's all this kind of turbulence going on in their communities about whether to run with these technologies or whether to go slowly is very tricky indeed. So I wouldn't expect too much there. But this is just the beginning of, of the picture. Um, this is kind of like we're out somewhere at third and fourth base. You know, there's, there's a first and second base that we're not seeing here, which we need to bring into this picture straight uh, away. These are conversations, debates that are going on within particular communities. I mean, each community with the opportunity to make use of AI or robotics or blockchain or whatever will have its own community debates about what's acceptable. What will accommodate the different concerns and interests and what will be compatible with that community's distinctive aspirations and values now that that is on a different level once we're talking about the kind of people we aspire to be as a community and let's just talk in terms of nation states here even though i don't for one minute suggest that all nation states fit this ideal type of a community or that you don't find ideal typical communities away from nation states we find we find communities in all sorts of places transnationally and of course sub at national national level as Borowitz have reminded us frequently um that so um in in but anyway, anyway in various myriad communities there will be debates going on about their reception uh, of new technologies i mean there might be some communities have already made a decision not to, not to run with new technologies they've gone as far technologically as they want thank you very much uh, and they just, you know, there's not much to debate there. But in most other communities where they're, they're willing to go with communities, provided they think the benefits in a general sense outweigh the harms, then there's going to be a debate about, about the regulatory framework for those technologies. Um, but where the issues that are being raised in the debate are not just about the individual preferences and priorities of individuals, but about the values, commitments, aspirations, the defining, yeah, defining standards of that particular community, what makes that the community that it is, then we're into a different level of, of discussion. And I'll come back to that in just a minute. But if you have this picture of this frantic, turbulent debate going on within several communities, but these are within distinct communities, then we have to make one other thing, that, that all these communities and all these members of these communities uh, are simply not viable uh, unless there is a critical infrastructure in place, which assures the possibility of these kind of communities being formed, these kind of debates taking place. Uh, and this is the most important level uh, of, uh, and it's a level really that, uh, although we think about now with a pandemic and we think about with the Anthropocene and climate change, and we may think about, I mean, if we read Shoshana Zuboff's book on surveillance capitalism, we might be thinking, yeah, this actually goes very deep. Um, I mean, the, that, um, the, the way that data is being collected uh, and mined and exchanged and analysed and then recycled back to shape the way our preferences go. And uh, Well, uh, I mean, this goes deep to the context in which we can operate at our, uh, as, as viable agents. Um, so, um, the, 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 this, this level of a critical infrastructure that, that makes everything else possible, uh, and as I say, I, just talked about it in a way that used the term viable. This is Josh Fair, Fairfield in his recent book, Runaway Technology, talks about the viability of um, the viability of all this. We can't do anything without this infrastructure or this staging or this platform being in place. These I, I, and in the abstract that um, was circulated ahead of this conference, I mentioned several things I've written in recent years where if people are interested they can read more about this but in my two more re recent books um, most recently Law 3.0 and before that Law Technology and Society in both those books uh, I sketch what I'm just talking about now which is three levels of regulatory responsibility starting at the top with with the infrastructure or the critical infrastructure for human social existence then down to the distinctive values of each particular community and then uh, 
down to uh, the particular debates within those communities about about new technologies. Um, so, uh, the let me just say a word or two about about these um, about the critical infrastructure. I, I, I mean, I, I envisage this in a very thin sense. Uh, these are the minimal conditions for human social existence. These are the minimum conditions just for bare existence on planet Earth. So, you know, when we compromise the planetary boundaries, then we're, we're compromising this infrastructure. Um, but um, they are also conditions which speak not only to the possibility of humans existing on this planet, but to the possibility of humans being viable, to use Fairfield's term, of uh, viable to operate as agents, that is to have a sense of their own self-interest so that in the debates that we started with, they know, you know what they think would suit them, but also to have a sense of the, uh, the interests of others and to know how far those interests are legitimate and to understand that you know, other agents have their own priorities and projects as well. And the people living together have to sometimes make compromises. So, and, Give, give due consideration to the interests of others. One can't be purely self-interested, but the context in which one can develop a sense of self of one's own agency and a sense of others and their agency, that, that's crucial. But this, this is pretty minimal stuff. These conditions have to be absolutely impartial, neutral, between individual humans, uh, individual agents with their own plans and projects, individual moral, um, uh, moral, moral principles criteria, I mean, I've said sometimes that I, the, the difficult concept of human dignity is one that I would try to track back all the way to these infrastructural conditions where they, they, they guarantee a context in which we can freely choose to do the right thing for the right reason. There's no virtue in doing the right thing if you don't do it for the right reason. And human dignity is about a context in which it's possible to do the wrong thing, but we as humans display our virtue by doing the right thing. So go right back. And that is not, however, backing any particular moral horse, so to speak. It's not, you know, for Kantians or for utilitarians or for communitarians or virtue theorists. I mean, it's not. It's just saying that there is a thin contextual set of conditions which make it possible for people to have a sense of their of moral reason and, and of what it is to act as a moral agent. Um, that's where we start. These, these are the, the absolute minimum conditions. Let's say again, the platform, the staging, for human, be, human humans then to begin to form their communities. Um, and as I say, uh, humans form all sorts of communities um, in relation to the what I call the global commons, the, infra the critical infrastructural conditions. There's no, negoci no, no negotiability there. There is room for interpretation about what precisely those conditions are. So this, these are truly cosmopolitan conditions. There's no, no community can uh, coherently deny that, that these are the paramount conditions to be maintained. Um, but, but within uh, each community, there can be quite different aspirations and values, provided they are compatible with respect for the global commons, for the, for the infrastructure. Um, so plurality engages, kicks in at this stage. Um, that we have kind of a uniform set of global conditions for all communities, but then many different communities, a myriad of communities, each with their own particular view of what kind of people they want to be. Um, and I'm quite relaxed about that, provided, as I say, uh, that these are uh, communities that respect the global conditions, the global commons. Um, within each particular community, again, now we're you know, down into a particular community, then the members of those communities contest how and when they want to take regulatory action against um, against new technologies, uh, whether they want to be permissive or prohibitory, and whether they want to be prohibiting right now, you know, um, or whether they're prepared to to wait a bit and see how things develop, see what the consequences might be, whether the risks are as they apprehended them. Um, but, um, in, and again, plenty of plurality there. Members of these communities, although they are signed up to the same aspirations, again, might have rather different views of their self-interest, uh, which they want to lobby for in, as I say, what's an essentially political process of negotiating or brokering accommodations between people uh, who have different priorities and different views. Um, but that's, that's, that's the sort of big picture uh, that we have 
well, and we start our debate about regulating at the right time and in the right way with the right measures. We start right in the thick of these debates within a particular community. And I say these are intra-community debates, but be within that community, there is a set of values uh, or commitments which take priority, which are privileged in the way that, you know, one of the laws and things is the right thing for some same communities that are created to right. So if your particular community is related to the human rights, then human rights arguments uh, are on a different plane uh, to uh, those uh, run-of-the-mill arguments that are part of the political debate. And there is a tendency and danger that we, we lose sight of that, that there is a hierarchy of interest within each community. Um, but beyond each community, all communities have to sign up for respect for uh, the global commons, for the critical infrastructure for all things, the infrastructure of all infrastructures. But why do they have to be signed up to it? Because these are the preconditions for humans uh, to, to exist and socially to do anything uh, that their agency permits them to do. Um, even to deny that they're committed to these things requires these conditions to be in place. You can't coherently deny the preconditions for all your for your existence and your activity. These are, but as I say, I emphasize again, these are pretty thin conditions. These are the absolutely bare essentials. Um, now, to bring this round to uh, the question of when, when we should be regulating, when's the right time, here's what I would suggest. Um, that if you are, if your concern relates to uh, the maintenance of the global commons, if you're looking at technologies that you think threaten human existence um, or threaten uh, to compromise the context for our agency, uh, then you can never be too early. You can never be too early in taking uh, a regulatory measure of, of well, this will support you. And with Liz, with Liz Fisher involved on this panel, I hesitate to talk about precautionary reasoning because Liz has done so much to clarify our thinking about this. But it seems to me, to put it very simply, that whilst you might be quite sceptical about precautionary reasoning, uh, stopping potentially beneficial development uh, on the chance that they might be doing something you really wouldn't want them to do, uh, where that is the context for that is the hurly-burly of everyday political debate, then yeah, we should be careful with precautionary reasons, it can be abused. But where you're talking about technologies that look as though they might be compromising the global commons, then you should not hesitate to be precautionary. Uh, and in fact, um, if I can put this in a way, I mean, the, the precautions should be applied in a very proactive way. It shouldn't be a matter of reaction, oh my goodness me, uh, what's all this plastic doing in the oceans? Or, uh, you know, what about climate change? Um, and we react to that in a precautionary way. We should be looking for, uh, in these technological profiles, we should be looking way ahead in our horizon scanning and foresight to uh, developments which look as though they might uh, be very, very dangerous indeed. And of course, AI, uh, I mean, a number of people have said, AI could be the best thing possible for us, it could be the worst thing possible. And the worst thing possible is that it will damage and compromise the global commons. I mean, I don't, I mean, if AI operates in ways which are benign relative to the interests of humans, so it's sort of paternalistic AI, these devices look after our welfare as they interpret our best interests. That's still compromising our agency, but it's not killing us. Um, but, uh, you know, we've lost control of the AI once it's in, the, in that mode. And you might want to say that what really matters for the global commons and our agency is that we remain fully in control of these AI tools, that they are just tools which we use in ways which we control. So AI is, is definitely in this basket of potentially very dangerous indeed. Um, and uh, we need to be looking at it in a high, I would say, highly precautionary way. But the important point is that in general, if you, you're not sure whether the default position should be too early, too late, well, in relation to the global commons, is too early is by far the better option every time. Because if you're too late, it's catastrophic. If we're talking about compromising conditions which will be catastrophic for humans or for their social existence, we're talking about the stuff out of which the worst dystopias are made. Um, when we get to the level of particular communities and the values that they privilege and the aspirations that they hold as being distinctive of their communities, I again, I mean, I incline here to think again that we should be too early rather than too late. This is a bit more complex. I don't have time to go into it. 
what my, my uncertainties and doubts about this. But I think if, I had, if it was one of these, well, which is it? Better to be too early or better to be too late? I would say better to be too early in ensuring that for the sake of the integrity of your community, you are defending the values which you hold particularly important and definitive, you know, distinctive of your identity as members of this particular community. Um, now, then, then we get to where I started with the messiness, the politicking of um, stakeholders and constituencies pushing for or pushing against uh, particular particular um i i have no i'm afraid i can't offer any <laughs> any great guidance in relation to that that which is of course the dominant i suppose the dominant activity but uh, i want to say that even though we might not be sure about when is the right time in relation to um matters that are just at that level of everyday negotiation and accommodation of competing and conflicting interests uh, i think we can be much clearer uh, about uh, what what is the right time in relation to both the you know threats to the community's defining values and above all threats to the global commons and the most critical infrastructure of all? If we have any sense that there's any kind of threat at either of those two levels, then far better to be too early than to be too late. That would be my view. Thanks very much. I hope that's stayed roughly within the twenty minutes. So we can uh, move on to the next speaker because uh, all the questions will be taken at the end. Hmm? Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Liz Fisher um, and I'm now going to um, put up a PowerPoint. So if you just... Um, and hopefully everybody um, can see that. Um, so today I'm going to present a paper on behalf of myself and my two wonderful co-authors who are also in the audience, Pasky Pascal and Wendy Wagner. Um, and the theme of our paper is actually looking at regulating within public administration. And on the one hand, that might seem to not have much to do with everything that we've just been discussing. You know, how do we regulate the world out there? Um, but Roger, in, the, in his last set of comments, talked about the precautionary principle, and he, he mentioned the work I've done on the precautionary principle. And much of my work on that has been to show that how we think about the precautionary principle relates to how we think about public administration and its power. So I'd suggest that this question um, is not as separate from the question of when to regulate um, as, as one might initially think. So the outline of our presentation is, first of all, I want to talk about the question that we're thinking about, our when and how to regulate question. Um, and what we're focusing on um, in this paper is on the use of AI in administrative decision making in US environmental regulation. And in particular, its use for determining the relationship between particular activities and particular products out there and their impact on environmental quality and human health. Next, we want to connect that question to Paskey, Wendy and I's ongoing intellectual project, which is about science and administrative accountability. Third, we want to show how AI is distinct from the issues that we've worked on it before, um, but also connected. And it's important to see both those distinctions and, and those connections. And finally, um, we want to talk about how, in, in terms of responding, the, the, the answer to the question about how to regulate and when to regulate, we argue, is a question about building institutional architecture. And I found it really interesting that Roger was talking about infrastructure, and that's something we might want to explore in discussion. Okay, so to begin with, um, as I'm sure many of you know, many public lawyers, administrative lawyers in different jurisdictions have been concerned about the rise of AI in public administration decision making. Um, here's an example. This was an excellent report from the Administrative Conference of the United States published last year, um, which raises concerns about the, the, the kind of black box nature of AI in administrative decision making. Um, and it, like many scholars, have called for meaningful accountability and actionable transparency. Now, 
before we go any further, I think it's useful to, to ponder what is meaningful accountability. Um, and Pasky, Wendy and I um, draw on a definition from Bovins and Shulman. Meaningful accountability necessitates a more careful look at the design of accountability mechanisms and practices. It signals a shift in focus from demands for more or less accountability to questions about what types of accountability are relevant and the conditions and contexts in which they are effective. So let me now relate this to our intellectual project. Um, so for over 10 years, and you can see it from that photo because I have a different hair colour then, um, Wendy Paskey and I have been working on opening up the black box of scientific analysis in administrative decision making in the US and connecting it to lawyers. Now, part of that work has been showing why an understanding of models and scientific models is important for um, lawyers to grasp. Part of it has been developing educational materials. There's a, a module that we put together for the National Academies of, of Sciences. And part of it has also been seeing how much this issue about how much we understand the relationship between science and um, administration has also been affected by the political turmoil in, in the US and in particular the, the Trump administration. And you can see there um, an opinion piece we did a couple of years ago in science. Um, now, what in developing this work and studying the, how models have been used in particularly re regulatory contexts, studying how courts have reviewed regulatory models, um, what has emerged from all of that is a belief of the importance that to obtain um, meaningful accountability, you need to build an institutional architecture. And that institutional architecture really has three aspects. First, there are a set, if you're using science and different types of sciences, you need what we call internal yardsticks, ex ante criteria about what is the expectation of good scientific practices and good analysis. But there needs to be a compliance assurances that those yardsticks will be applied within public administration. And thirdly, that enforcement and review from external um, institutions, most obviously the courts, needs to relate to those internal yardsticks. And, and what we've shown is, is where there is a healthy relationship between that external review and that internal review, that is the most significant. Now, I think what's really interesting about this is that our work is in, in science and administration, but it's really relevant to all administrative law because so much of public administration is about assessing information. And the photos I have here are of um, the pensions building built in the 1870s, 1880s in Washington, DC. Um, and it was a building um, which housed the administration who, for, for those who were assessing war pensions, et cetera, et cetera. And the design of the building, the architecture of the building was designed for the most effective, but also the most empathetic assessing of pensions um, assessment. So you can see all the offices are on the outside. So there was lots of lights so people could read files. There are big ramps so trolleys could be pushed up with files. But in the middle where the public was, would be um, is open and it's grand and it is also airy. Okay, so um, let me now move on to my third bit. AI and what makes it different. And I should say, um, I am, this is really, um, Pasky has put this together and I hope I, I explain it um, correctly. So if we think in the environmental regulation context, the question in the context of many administrative decision-making is what happens to Y if X? And that question is being asked usually because of legislation. Um, take the Clean Air Act, you know, um, Air quality needs to be such so as to ensure public health with an adequate margin of safety. But you need scientific assessment to figure out what that means. Um, and what you need to get to is a, is a probability of, well, if you have X, will you get Y? Now, this has always been a challenge in environmental decision making because of the open-ended nature um, of ecological systems because of uh, the limits of our knowledge, because of um, lack of data, because we're trying to predict the future. But there has been the use of, of kind of mechanistic models, 
Modelling is, is a key feature of this area of regulation. Um, and those models over time have been able to develop um, through the use of more data, etc. And these models are largely experimental and they are developed on the basis of certain axioms about how the physical kind of world works. AI is in a sense related to this. The big difference is that with AI, there is far more data. Now, in terms of that data, and let me just put all this up, that data might change over time. But the idea is, is with an AI model, is that the data, with lots and lots of data, you can start, in a sense, testing different axioms, and that hopefully will develop a more accurate picture of what the probability is. Now, how is AI different? Well, first of all, you need lots of good quality data, and that's different from existing models. Secondly, it's far more dynamic than an existing model. So that, in a sense, the data might change over time, but so too will the axioms. And finally, this is far more siloed, arguably, as a process, particularly because of the involvement of data scientists. Now, the important point to appreciate in all of this is it is, AI is distinct, but we can see its relationship to the pre-existing use of models in regulatory decision-making. Okay, so returning to the when and how to regulate question. Um, one thing that we would just flag before going any further is, as I mentioned, the ACUS reports raises concerns about the black box nature of AI. We would suggest that AI is not as comparatively inscrutable as often depicted. What I've just explained, um, you know, does explain the process. Now, there are issues to do with the level of explainability. But meaningful accountability is a challenge, if we go back to that kind of design question. There is a need for lots of good quality data. Now, in the environmental context, that is a challenge because um, Wendy Wagner has talked about the tragedy of the information comments. Um, there is often no incentive to produce information or high quality information about data quality. Likewise, there is a question about what kind of data do these models need? Secondly, this dynamic approach to thinking about our understanding of the world. On the one hand, that is very consistent with science. Science does not stay still. It, it keeps sort of, you know, evolving in light of new knowledge and new understanding. But administrative decision-making tends to be very static. A standard is set at one point in time on the basis of particular axioms and particular data. How, how do you take into account dynamism in, in that kind of context? And finally, this issue about the silo effect. How do you deal with the fact <clears throat> that there may be parts of an AI model which are particularly siloed? Now, um, Models, as anyone who's worked with them knows, are actually internally interdisciplinary. There are often experts working with, e with each other. But there may be aspects of, of, of the data science aspect of AI that, that makes it more prone to siloing. Okay, so what might be the way forward in thinking about this? Um, and as I said, this is a working paper at the moment, um, so we are really still at early stages. But our argument, built on our previous work, is to say, well, what you need to focus on is developing an institutional architecture for AI accountability. So if we think about this issue about data needs, what, what kind of potential things may you develop in building this architecture? Well, you need protocols. So, so ex ante kind of um, statements about what is good data. What is reliable data? Where will we get this data from? There also needs to be a general mapping of data avail availability and data needs and raising issues about, well, where are going to be the resources come from if we need more data? Um, there needs to be thought about where AI use, where the data is proprietary. And our bottom line here is that there needs to be both more internal within an institution and external architecture to to really govern these data kind of needs. Okay, the issue of 
AI being dynamic. Um, so as I said, one of the features of administrative law, and this is an issue not just with AI, but we can think of other areas such as nature conservation, is it tends to be re relatively rigid in the yardsticks for acceptable action that it creates. And one of the, the challenges moving forward is how do you create a more flexible and revisable set of yardsticks? Um, there also needs to be a requirement for periodic updating of regulatory standards. Now, there are already precedents that exist for that in the US. If we take the Clean Air Act, national ambient air quality standards need to be revised every five years. Um, but there also needs to be rewards for AI. And, and one thing um, I should mention is AI in environmental regulation, and in particular standard setting, is still at, in relatively early days compared to its use in other government areas. Um, because AI is dynamic, it can be very off-putting um, because it, it doesn't sit necessarily easily with those existing kind of legal practices. So our bottom line, architecture needs to be, make more constructive space for this kind of dynamic approach without losing accountability. Okay, finally, silo and sandbox challenges. Um, again, there needs to be, even before kind of the building of models, a kind of ex ante evaluation commitments to actually review the models as they go along by different groups. And there needs to be an insurance that a model actually connects to a legislative mandate or an institutional expectation. Um, there need to be within an administrative body internal interdisciplinary processes which set up the best kind of methods. Now, they cannot only be internal, they also need to be sort of connected to the public and to kind of more deliberative processes with how framing of how this a tool will be used. And there also needs to be a focus on the professional society of data scientists. Um, so the bottom line, need ex ante to recognise these shifts in internal functions and operations and redesign the processes to limit problems before they actually happen. Okay, so bringing all this together, um, and this, this slide is really just building on everything I have just said, what one can see is an emerging institutional architecture. And it's an architecture, um, which I think is just a couple of things to note about it, and I won't go through it in detail. The first is, it is both about what internally goes on within an administrative institution. Um, and building on the work of Sid Shapiro, we describe this as inside out accountability. Inside out accountability processes about setting standards and calling people to account on the basis of those standards, as well as external kind of accountability, what we would call outside in accountability. And it's important that they relate to each other. The second thing, and this really comes to the theme of, of um, this session about when, is what we're making clear, and I think this echoes some of the points that Roger was making in his presentation, is that there is an important point of building this architecture early and building it into the design of the use of these types of models. Now, given the dynamism, there is a flexibility to these architectures, but it's important to, to, to realise that these architectures are always kind of operating. Okay, I'm nearly there. Um, conclusions, returning to the when and how to regulate question. Um, AI does present distinct challenges for meaningful accountability in administrative law. Um, one could argue that administrative law has faced similar challenges before, but they still are distinct. Um, we would suggest that responding to those challenges is not really just about explainability or transparency, um, which kind of sort of suggests it's a one shot, you know, if I get my magic wand, I wave it and it's suddenly explainable. It's actually about building this institutional architecture, which is both about the disciplines that AI draws on, it is about administrative institutions, it is about law that connects inside out with outside in accountability. Um, and as we've suggested, that architecture needs to focus on data needs, dynamism and silo effects. And I would suggest that this is not only valuable for, for the use of AI and environmental regulation, but for all of administrative law. 
Um, because really what it is ensuring is that administrative law is the law of public administration. Um, that's all I need to say. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Fisher. So it's now, we can now move to the uh, third uh, speaker, so Professor Kuhn Franken from uh, Utrecht uh, University. So, uh, Kuhn, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm. Uh, I'm talking today about uh, about a, a bit of a different topic, that of uh, online platforms and, in particular, uh, gig economy platforms, uh, in which the supply and demand uh, for particular uh, jobs are being uh, organized uh, these days. And in this respect, um, I will be talking not so much about uh, regulation of technology, uh, but uh, regulation of the way uh, people uh, use uh, this technology, and also the way platforms uh, make a business out of uh, applying platform uh, technologies. And I will do so not from a uh, legal point of view, uh, but more from an economic uh, point of view. Um, let me first um, explain you what I mean with uh, platform economy. Now, uh, this has become a term uh, to denote uh, the major change uh, going on uh, in uh, the global economy in the past uh, 20 years or so, in which we have seen the very rapid growth of uh, of platform uh, companies, uh, sometimes called uh, big tech, uh, in which um, uh, we have uh, Apple, uh, Facebook, uh, Google, Amazon, Microsoft as uh, the well-known uh, platforms in the West, but we have equivalent platforms uh, in China and, uh, and, and, and only very few in, in, in Europe. Uh, and uh, we rely on these uh, platforms as a critical infra infrastructure, uh, but these are the technological infrastructures. And on these infrastructures, uh, there are many smaller platforms, apps, that we download on our mobile phones and that we use uh, to organize our daily lives. And this is the type of smaller platforms I'm interested in. But what uh, is the common feature then of, uh, of online platforms? Well, I use a very uh, simple generic definition by Kenny and Seisman, is that platforms uh, mediate social and economic interactions online. And uh, the word mediation here is, is crucial because platforms do not just provide a neutral uh, meeting space uh, for us to interact, but they structure uh, those interactions in particular ways and also extract uh, value from it, uh, including uh, data. Now, there is a range of uh, platforms out there uh, that uh, can be distinguished in, in the following three like manner. So, the first main distinction people make when talking about the platform economy uh, is to distinguish between technology platforms that we use uh, to run. Uh, um, the internet to run uh, apps, uh, Apple and Google being the main ones here in the West, and distinguish them from exchange platforms, which are platforms that we use uh, to exchange information, uh, goods or services. Um, and among exchange platforms, you can then distinguish between social media, in which people uh, do not transact, but share uh, symbolic content. But obviously uh, the platforms do transact with advertising companies uh, to make uh, money from personalized uh, advertisement. And this business model uh, in social media is very different from a transaction-based uh, platforms uh, that uh, use uh, commissions uh, for every transaction that takes place. Um, and uh, in this space, you can distinguish between business to consumer platforms like 
Amazon being the main one connecting us as consumers uh, to uh, businesses that sell uh, goods from uh, peer-to-peer uh, platforms in which individual people very often, uh, yeah, uh, anyone can participate in that, but in which individual people uh, engage in economic transactions. Uh, for example, renting out uh, your home or a seat in your car uh, called sharing economy or renting out your labor, uh, doing cleaning, doing taxi drive, doing uh, tutoring, uh, babysitting, uh, translating, what have you. And all those personal services uh, traded uh, via platforms we call now the gig economy. Now, the way I define gig economy is that it is about ex ante specified paid tasks carried out by independent contractors and mediated by online platforms. So in, in simpler terms, you could say uh, gig economy is about freelancers who get their assignments via the internet. And uh, here are the, some of the main examples. Of course, Uber uh, is the most well-known uh, in which uh, independent contractors uh, get uh, taxi rides uh, via an app and are paid by the gig, by the ride, and are not paid while they're waiting. So this is very different from uh, traditional business in which people are employed by a company. Well, same for uh, Deliveroo here. It's interesting that there are actually four parties involved, the platform, the restaurant, uh, the rider and, and the client. So it's even more complex uh, type of platform. Then we have for also cleaning platform like Helpling in Europe. And a very different type of platform is the online, uh, our online gigs. Uh, so for example, translation, uh, in which you get your, uh, in which you can send uh, your output uh, online um, via platforms like Upwork. Now, uh, just to uh, clarify, uh, uh, the notion of gig economy only emerged uh, with the advent of platforms. Uh, but if we take an historical perspective, obviously the gig economy preceded the rise of platforms because before the advent of platforms, we were already uh, seeing many businesses organized uh, by day labor uh, or uh, by informal labor markets for cleaning, for example, um, but also uh, typical freelance businesses like, like translating or, or what have you. So if you take a bit a broader notion of the gig economy, uh, you could say uh, also offline intermediation of gigs is, is, is gig economy. Uh, you could even say it's not just about services, but also about renting out your goods. And then you could include the sharing economy. You could say it's also about uh, unpaid work and voluntary work. Uh, and you could even argue uh, that there are also uh, employees who, who typically have gig-like work, uh, but nevertheless are employed. Uh, uh, and even some platforms make use of an employee employment uh, contractual relationship. So if we take a much broader perspective, then the gig economy would roughly uh, be uh, maybe 20% of an, of an uh, economy. Uh, and uh, nowadays, uh, maybe only five or 10% of that gig economy is organized through online uh, platforms. The remainders we still organize via temp agencies or via informal uh, labor markets uh, or via voluntary organizations or what have you. But in principle, all these type of activities in the future could be organized uh, through online platforms. And this expectation that uh, this will happen uh, can explain uh, why the current gig economy platforms are evaluated so highly, even though they haven't made any uh, profit uh, yet. So there's the expectations that a large part of the labor market in the future will be organized uh, by these gig economy platforms. Now back to platforms more generally, what makes platforms uh, so uh, 
so different from other uh, organizational forms uh, in our uh, society in the past. But in my view, uh, what uh, all platforms do uh, while they enable us to interact is that they collect uh, data on how we interact uh, and, uh, and what kind of text messages uh, we leave, where we are using GPS, uh, what we are willing to pay, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this data, of course, uh, is valuable to improve uh, the working of a platform, either through AI or uh, through human labor, but also uh, presents a value on its own because some of these data are sold to other, uh, to other parties. Now, what platforms also do is that they match al uh, algorithmically. So basically platforms is an example of robotization in which human labor that used to do the matching in labor markets uh, are now being replaced by algorithms that do uh, the matching. Now this matching uh, can have different degrees. So the extreme uh, degree would be uh, autom uh, automated uh, algorithmic matching like in Uber. Uh, but uh, in most uh, gig economy platforms, uh, the matching is just ranking alternatives uh, and uh, finally uh, the client still uh, has to make the final decision uh, whom of the offers uh, to, to choose from. And finally, and I think that is an, uh, a very important feature of, uh, of platforms, is that they can exclude participants at will. So if uh, for whatever reason, a platform uh, thinks a particular participant like a taxi driver or maybe a client um, is undesirable as a participant on their platform, uh, they can technologically exclude that person by cutting off that uh, IP address. Um, they also do onboarding. Uh, so many platforms uh, first, uh, uh, check, uh, for example, criminal records or identity, and also uh, already ex ante, they can, they can exclude participants at will. And you have no uh, means to appeal uh, those decisions. And, and also you have no insight uh, why you may have been banned from the platform. So from, from an economic point of view, this is a very interesting feature of platform because they are able to manage and self-regulate the markets that they are and uh, the main reason they exclude participants is that uh, they want to maintain a certain quality level of service uh, and also make sure that uh, fraud uh, is not uh, happening on their platform. So in a way, they take over the function of the state uh, that uh, traditionally regulates markets to make sure uh, there's no fraud and consumers are protected and instead uh, platforms take over that job. So is this then a disruption? That's often a term you hear when, when, when platforms are being discussed. Uh, it's a disruptive innovation. Well, funnily enough, it's not disruptive in my view in the economic sense of the word because uh, platforms uh, generally do not uh, replace uh, current businesses. They are not threatening uh, incumbent businesses, but what they mostly do is they organize very fragmented uh, labor markets in which only small participants uh, are active. Um, and uh, what is important to note is that uh, these, these platforms uh, are active in markets that were already of a freelance uh, type or an informal type. Well, uh, traditional businesses are, at least for the moment, uh, not very much uh, platformatized yet. However, politically, I would say uh, it is very much a disruptive innovation and uh, because uh, it poses new questions to uh, some of the fundamental economic institutions we have built up in the last hundred years, notably labor law, uh, and competition law, and to some extent also consumer law, and uh, the uh, and, and the issue of tax uh, income tax. Okay, 
Now, if you want to put it a bit more sociologically or, or theoretically, uh, you could say that uh, platforms are, are, are changing uh, the institutional logics of the market, the state and the profession. And I'll try to explain what I mean with that. Um, well, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in the normal economy, so to speak, the pre-platform economy, there were basically two flavors. Either you were an employee or you were, or you were an independent contractor and, and, and you run your own business. And now with the advent of platforms, we have created something in between uh, because we have people who are legally speaking independent contractors and that's also how the platform uh, are uh, treating them and most of the time also the tax uh, office but if you look at the control and power that a platform can exercise over these independent contractors you would uh, argue they may be better classified as employees of the platform uh, uh, and the platform exercises control uh, in, in, in mainly two ways. Uh, one is that uh, they can extract a lot of economic value uh, by charging commissions, sometimes even dynamically, um, uh, but also uh, because they have a lot of market power. Uh, many freelancers have no other option than uh, to use one or two platforms to find uh, their business. Uh, but they also exercise um, uh, control uh, because they uh, monitor uh, the actions of workers and they reward them if they perform well and they do not uh, reward them if they perform badly and that's very much what uh, employers uh, do um, and uh, so there are now a lot of Lord, uh, court cases uh, uh, whether or not uh, and under what conditions these independent contractors should actually be classified as employees of a platform. Um, now, they also threaten uh, the institutional logic of the state. I already explained that because they self-regulate markets and they, they do not need, uh, at least so they claim, uh, market regulation anymore. Uh, so, for example, when Uber entered uh, Western European countries, uh, their, their usual story was to say, listen, uh, our uh, taxi drivers may not have a license uh, because when they started, in, 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 uh, they, they, they actually used unlicensed uh, drivers uh, as, as their chauffeurs. But they said, uh, we can use unlicensed drivers because we, uh, uh, we can discipline them. Huh? We can make sure that uh, drivers, even if they have no diploma and no license, uh, will uh, perform uh, well, because if they don't, we will ban them from the platform. And we can uh, see that from, uh, from the co consumer reviews. Now, and this is also why many economists, uh, at least initially, were very enthusiastic about gig economy platforms, because it was a form of innovation uh, that did not need uh, state regulation and, and could uh, therefore have markets uh, work more efficiently. And finally, uh, less uh, discussed in the literature, uh, platforms also challenge the institutional logic of professions. So in many uh, professions, especially also freelance professions, uh, there are professional norms uh, that are uh, either codified and, and for example, uh, tested by diplomas, uh, but are, can also be informal. Uh, and, and, um, and, and, and covered maybe by, by some, some labels. And, um, and all these professional norms uh, were, were, yeah, came into existence to safeguard the quality of work in an otherwise very unregulated uh, market like freelance markets usually are. Nowadays, with platforms, uh, we enter another regime because platforms do not ask for diplomas or licenses. Uh, in principle, they allow everyone on the platform. But again, if uh, you don't perform well in the eyes of consumers, uh, as, as expressed by rating of reviews, they will uh, lower your uh, ranking in search results or even ban you from the platform. 
So they have a quality control of the profession, which is ex post based on rating and reviews and no longer ex ante based on professional norms. Now, because they challenge so much of the existing institutions in our society, obviously uh, these platforms have met a lot of resistance and uh, many parties called for regulation. Um, and that's uh, where I want to spend uh, the last five minutes on. And here, I think we need, uh, we, uh, yeah, what economists usually do is they, they, they look at the public interest at stake, which are usually connected to externalities. Um, and then uh, they look uh, for ways to remedy uh, them. Uh, but here we have to uh, distinguish between public interests that are common to all platforms uh, and that's mainly what other speakers uh, today and yesterday have talked about. So things like privacy, antitrust, uh, uh, secure, cyber security, discrimination. And these things uh, are mainly dealt with uh, at the level of the European Union. But if you study the gig economy platforms, uh, it is much more about the very specific uh, regulatory issues uh, that matter in, 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 in a specific market. Uh, and here uh, the public interests are the level playing field. Uh, for example, why should homeowners that rent out their home to tourists not comply to the same health and safety regulations as hotels? Uh, uh, if, 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 uh, so there is basically not a level uh, playing field, at least the hotel business uh, would argue. An issue of tax compliance. Now, if gig economy platforms become very popular in the future, maybe uh, most of us will engage at least in part time uh, as freelancers in the future. And then the question is, uh, how is the tax office going to make sure we pay our taxes over that income? We know a lot of freelance income uh, uh, is not uh, reported to the tax office. So the tax office uh, faces a big issue in the future. And then there's the comp consumer protection issue. Well, I, I discussed that already at length eh, that uh, platforms try to cover that themselves. And finally, the labor protection issue that we have organized in labor law, but that only applies to employees. And here we have people uh, who are not employees, but nevertheless very much dependent on and controlled by a company. Uh, and that's why unions have become very active and very vocal uh, and critical about gig economy platforms in the past couple of years. Now, a scheme uh, I use to think about regulation in the gig economy is, 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 to, is to ask uh, three questions. Well, first of all, when, uh, when do platform interests and public interests actually converge? Uh, and in many cases, they can converge. For example, it's in the platform interests uh, that people um, um, yeah, are, uh, are delivering quality. Uh, and that's also uh, the public interest uh, of consumer protection. So here, uh, maybe we can indeed uh, actually deregulate some of the co consumer protection that is currently in place uh, as platforms have other means to, 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 to safeguard uh, that. Uh, same for tax. Uh, uh, platforms, uh, well, it's not so much in the interest of platforms uh, to, uh, to, to, to have uh, platform workers be taxed. Uh, but if they can be a partner uh, with, uh, of the government uh, to actually uh, do the taxation on behalf of the government, then the platform actually raises entry barriers and also creates more legitimacy with governments. So some platforms are actually very eager uh, to do the taxation on behalf of the government um, in return for a legal uh, status and other uh, advantages. But the main question, of course, is to ask when do platform interests and public interests diverge? Yeah. And that's uh, especially in the uh, labor uh, sphere, because it's in the platform interest to pay uh, workers as less 
uh, and as low as possible because everything they pay uh, to the worker means uh, less income uh, for the platform. Yeah, it's a, a simple surplus issue that has to be divided among two parties. Um, on the other hand, uh, there are public interests uh, to uh, protect workers uh, and to provide them with secure incomes and insurance against, uh, you know, against uh, uh, in, uh, inability and otherwise uh, unsafe uh, working conditions. So here there is a real issue that indeed the, the unions are addressing. And then the third thing is, okay, if there is a uh, regula regulatory uh, uh, change, uh, should the platforms be the ones that enforce that regulation or should enforcement be done more traditionally by, uh, by governments? Now, and the final scheme then today I want to share with you is a kind of uh, heuristic that we uh, developed for uh, government and, and the context was very much the Dutch uh, national government and uh, local governments how they can think about uh, regulation and gig economy platforms. And this was also used to think about uh, sharing economy platforms like, uh, like Airbnb. And in all cases, what we say is that uh, when, when platforms enter uh, your uh, economy, uh, most of them never uh, grow in, in any uh, meaningful size, they will never make uh, any profit and they will leave the market in one, two or three years. So we say, okay, it doesn't make much sense to immediately start to regulate platforms uh, if, they are, if they have not been proven to be viable anyway. And there's a lot of venture capital and speculation going on. Uh, so uh, uh, most, most platforms simply fail. So the, the, the default is to to tolerate and see what happens and see uh, if consumers like it, see if externalities emerge and try to learn and try to get into contact with platforms uh, and, 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 and also see what is their experience. Now, once a platform starts growing, there is the, you can basically have uh, you basically have three options. One is to enforce uh, regulation already in place, and that may be very hard uh, because uh, if a platform grows big, uh, it may mean that uh, millions of people start using, uh, for example, Airbnb, and it's very hard uh, to to enforce regulations with with millions of users. Um, uh, and if you do so, you, you are bound almost to, to, to ask the platform to help you uh, enforce the regulation. And that's what Amsterdam, for example, has been trying to do with Airbnb uh, with different degrees of success in the past. So two other options then in the middle are uh, either to come up with new type of regulation uh, and, uh, and a typical uh, way uh, that governments go about this is to use uh, caps to say, listen, uh, we, we allow people uh, to make some money uh, over a platform, but only up to a certain amount per month or only up to a certain hour, a number of hours uh, per week. And in this way, they can make sure that on the one hand, uh, the benefits uh, can, be, uh, can be gained, uh, but also that it doesn't rival uh, with the more formalized uh, forms of the economy. Uh, and this was the typical reaction to, uh, to Airbnb in most cities, uh, but also uh, uh, to, uh, to, to gig economy uh, Activity, for example, Belgium allows you to do it up to 10,000 euros a year. Uh, and, and, a th and a third way to go about it is to say, well, if platforms are indeed able uh, to self-regulate uh, the markets that they organize, you may uh, deregulate some of the old regulations uh, and uh, without harming too much uh, uh, the, the interest of consumers or, or, or third parties. And, uh, and this also helps you as a government to, to, re, to remain legitimate because it may be 
more important that you are able to enforce uh, the regulations that remain after the regulation uh, rather than uh, to keep the regulations as they are but then being unable to actually enforce them so uh, in the us uh, this this deregulation is actually uh, what we have seen happening in uber uh, contrary to to europe uh, where most U.S. states allow uh, now unlicensed uh, drivers uh, to offer taxi drives, uh, rides uh, via the apps of uh, Uber and, and, and Lyft. So I want to leave it uh, at that uh, today. And uh, I'll uh, wait for the questions after the final talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Kun. So we are moving to the last uh, presentation for this session. So I will leave the floor to Norberto Andrade and uh, for the talk for the last panel. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, hope you can hear me and see the, the screen that I'm sharing. So hopefully everything is working. Um, first of all, thank you so much uh, to the organizers for the for the kind invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to be among such distinguished uh, speakers and, and experts um, on these matters. Um, I have to start by saying that it's a, a great pleasure to be back, even if virtually in in Pisa. Uh, many many years ago, I was an Erasmus student uh, at the Faculty of Law, the University of Pisa, and I used to pass in front of the Scuola Superiore Santana every day on, on my way to the to the canteen so those were definitely good times and and bring back uh, very good memories so my my presentation today will not necessarily be about uh, when to regulate but what can and i think what we should do in order to be prepared for when that moment comes so it's it's not about the the when it's about preparing for the when um, and in that way, gain a better understanding of how to, to regulate. So how can we do this? And basically what we'll be talking about is the issue of, of experimentation, of policy and regulatory uh, experimentation. And I'll try to be very concrete about, about this. And I'll tell you about um, a program that uh, we've recently uh, launched called uh, Open Loop. It's a global program that tries to bridge the gap between tech, technology and policy innovation. That is between those that are building uh, emerging technologies and those that are regulating them. They, this program consists in a series of experimental uh, governance exercises where we leverage different methodologies, uh, namely regulatory sandboxes, where uh, we try to contribute to the evaluation um, and improvement of existing uh, legal frameworks. Um, and also through uh, policy prototyping programs, through which we support the co-creation and testing of new governance frameworks. So before getting into uh, the nitty gritty details of Open Loop, I think it's uh, useful just to distinguish and provide some clarity on what these two different methodologies consist of, the regulatory sandboxes and the policy prototyping. Um, they both belong to what one could say the experimental governance family. They are sort of, of cousins, but they do different things and operate in different contexts, namely in different uh, regulatory environments. So starting with regulatory sandboxes, they tend to operate in the context of existing legislation, and they allow for the testing of technological innovations under a, regular, a regulator's oversight. So they are particularly useful when we're trying to reform existing rules to accommodate new technological developments. So I think the, the most prominent um, example would be the, the regulatory sandboxes that have been used around the world to experiment with changes to existing financial regulatory um, rules. And the idea here is that try to make uh, um, those rules to better accommodate new financial technology applications and, and tools. Policy prototyping programs, they operate in the absence of existing specific legislation, at least the legislation in the domain where we're doing the prototype one. And they allow for regulatory experimentation when contemplating a new regulatory framework. Uh, so the focus is not on updating the existing one to accommodate new technology. Regulatory sandboxes are more formalistic in nature. So they operate within the boundaries of an existing piece of legislation. And in the case of the fintech regulatory sandboxes, 
they tend to be aimed at testing that piece of legislation by granting a specific uh, temporary relief or an exemption of specific legal requirements, creating a sort of lighter and less stringent regulatory environments for the companies that are participating in those regulatory sandboxes. The same is actually true for regulatory sandboxes on AI. So one of the objectives of uh, those type of regulatory sandboxes is actually to provide guidance to companies on how to ensure compliance with existing uh, and relevant privacy and data protection regulations in the context of new and innovative technological advancements such as um, AI. So regulatory sandboxes in, in this um, lens, what they do is to promote a greater understanding of the regulatory requirements and how AI-based products and services can meet those requirements while complying with data protection regulations in practice. So they have a sort of like educational and clarifying role to the companies that participate, but that doesn't mean that they do not dismiss the provision of, of wider recommendations to the legislator vis-a-vis -vis new uh, and forthcoming laws. Uh, policy prototyping programs, um, on the other hand, are less formalistic. So they do not necessarily tackle a specific piece of legislation by subtracting or making those rules less stringent. They actually add and co-create new legal or proxy legal provisions uh, that can help inform uh, lawmaking uh, processes. So policy prototyping operates um, in the absence of that specific legislation, but they do not. But that does not mean that uh, they operate in a legal vacuum. Obviously, these type of exercises must fit into the existing legal and institutional frameworks in order to be both legitimate and uh, effective. Last thing that I think is interesting to note about policy prototyping programs is that they provide a more holistic experimental governance platform. So they can examine and test both regulatory and non-regulatory instruments. And this is particularly useful in the field of AI, because given the difficulty in assessing the most appropriate and feasible balance amongst different governance instruments, you know, we can talk about laws, regulations, standards, ethical frameworks, principles, codes of conduct. Policy prototyping programs allow us to provide a, a testing platform that can explore the different combinations and calibrations among those instruments. So getting back to the OPA loop and, and what OPA loop does, it's, uh, it's, it, first of all, it's a consortium. It is, is a, a series of pilot projects through which we mobilize a coalition of both public and private actors. So we partner with governmental institutions, but also with industry partners and academia and, and civil society. They are sort of regulatory innovation labs that develop and test a policy idea. And they're very flexible and versatile. By policy idea, we can, we can be based on a proposed law, we can be based on self-regulation or a code of conduct or industry guidelines, as long as it's in the field of new and emerging uh, technologies. They are also um, empirical. So there are empirical problems that provide evidence-based policy input to improve the existing governance frameworks or to inform the lawmaking processes themselves. So what we try to do with, with Open Loop through this program is to look at how technology is built and deployed and how we can translate this approach to um, policy making. So why shouldn't policy making uh, be done in a similar way to how actual technology is built uh, by uh, adopting and endorsing an experimental and iterative um, way of doing things? As, as we all know, new technology is never created on one go. It's not the first version uh, that goes directly to, to market. It, it goes through a continuous experimental and iterative process, a sort of trial and error um, method so our proposition is to approach policy in a similar way, where we, for example, would have alpha phases where we do research, we experiment and test, and beta phases where we iterate and refine before proposing that product, that policy uh, more broadly. This is in relates to what Professor Fisher was saying about the dynamics of AI versus the static, na static nature of rule making. Um, why don't we make that static nature a little bit more dynamic by borrowing some of that dynam uh, dynamics and dynamism of, of AI and, and new technologies. So more concretely, how, uh, how are these type of programs actually um, um, done in practice? So policy prototyping programs, they, they follow um, a number of fundamental uh, steps when it comes to, to being rolled out. First, we gather a group of tech companies. Um, so companies that are provisioning products or services that are powered by AI technologies. They are the participants of, of the Open Loop program. 
Secondly, we co-create with them a normative framework, what we call a policy prototype on a specific topic related to AI. Uh, so these are the policy prototypes and they tend to focus on a specific uh, aspect or element of AI and not trying to do a prototype on, on holistic AI governance. So to give you a couple of examples, we can test um, things around transparency and explainability or fairness or, or risk assessment. So we try to be um, to narrow to a specific uh, theme within AI governance and test that theme accordingly. Third, once we have the participants and the policy prototypes, we ask participants to apply those prototypes to their specific AI applications. And what we do is that we collect information about their experience in doing so. So in other words, what we try to do is to test and evaluate those prototypes and their real world conditions. And we do that by collecting information from the participants as they apply those frameworks, those prototypes to their specific products and services. And the, the questions that we ask are related to how clear, operational and effective those prototype uh, policy prototypes are in order for us to learn their effects, both their strengths and limitations. So it's almost equally important to understand what doesn't work, what are the limitations of the prototype, uh, then its strengths and its, its added value. So fourth and the last step is that we, uh, by collecting that information, we apply the lessons learned to iterate and improve those policy prototypes. So we continuously make changes to adapt them to what we're hearing in practice from the participating companies. At the end of the day, the goal as, as, as a, a public policy project is to deliver evidence-based policy recommendations to policymakers. And this based on that empirical findings of the program and the feedback that we've collected. And we, we publish under Creative Commons the, the reports that synthesize and summarize those policy recommendations alongside the policy prototypes so that other companies, other stakeholders um, can build upon that uh, experience and can also uh, tell us what they think, what is what works and what doesn't, so we can continue working and improving those uh, those prototypes. So it's a sort of like running reality checks on tech policies and applying this, this methodology to support um, policy making. It's really to provide actionable and empirical input to regulators supporting their rulemaking process, giving them an added point, uh, empirical point to their work when devising and understanding what type of regulation um, we should be enacting. We do this supported by uh, a methodology. I won't go through all of the details, um, but basically we, we go through various steps. We start by analyzing you know, the problems and the challenges, identify clear governance gaps, understand what are the uncertainties in, uh, in the regulatory exercise. We define also the scope and the objective of each of the, of the programs. Um, also understanding what type of partners and participants uh, would fit well into, into those programs. We have a process to select and onboard the participants to do all the outreach. And more specifically, we also have a methodology to help to design and both create the policy prototype, that governance framework, but also how to test it, what we call the design test framework. What sort of questions and what point in time should we be asking the participants to get the feedback we need uh, to uh, evaluate and, and, uh, and come up with the policy recommendations that are the goal of the programs. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, given that it's, it's a global program, we are uh, active in different regions uh, around the world. We Right now we are up and running in four uh, different regions with, with others uh, in, the, in the making. Europe was actually the first one that we finalized, and I'll give you uh, an overview of how that program uh, went, but we also have partnerships with for example, the government of Singapore, the government of Mexico, where we are co-creating and testing uh, governance frameworks on transparency and explainability. And we are preparing one in, in India where we'll be looking at how to operationalize ethical principles, taking into account the specific uh, cultural background and context of, of the region. So I wanted to um, be more concrete uh, and tell, uh, tell you about the, a program that we rolled out in Europe where um, we tested a governance framework around uh, AI risk um, assessment. And uh, so a couple of words first of why did we choose risk assessment? Um, first of all, there, there is almost an overwhelming consensus and ample agreement on the need and importance of risk-based approach to AI. We've seen this 
across the board from from governments, from academics, from civil society, from from tech companies, um, emphasizing this the importance of of adopting a risk based perspective to um, to an AI regulation. But at the same time, what we've seen is that there are a wide variety of perspectives on how we actually can define and assess the risks posed uh, by AI systems. There have been very different risk assessment modalities that have been put forward. We've seen binary ones uh, that kind of structure and divide the world of AI into high risk and low risk. We've seen a multi-tier risk classification, uh, for example, by the German Data Ethics Commission. We've seen a, a, prescript, a prescriptive approach, namely the one that the European Commission laid out in its white paper um, for AI regulation. We've also seen a procedural approach to risk assessment, namely the one that was adopted by the Singapore AI governance model framework and actually by the high level expert groups in terms of their assist assessment list uh, for trustworthy uh, AI. We've seen quantitative approach to risk assessment uh, that is present in Canada's algorithmic impact assessment tool, uh, also qualitative um, approaches, human rights driven, and others that tend to align to GDPR, data protection impact assessments. So a very wide variety and diversity of approaches on how to actually do risk assessment. And at the same time, we've also seen um, a lack of uh, development of concrete and operational AI risk assessment frameworks. There are uh, noteworthy exceptions, but uh, there, there is not, um, the, it doesn't match the, the emphasis on risk assessment the number of, of operational AI risk assessments that would make that a reality. So we've seen a sort of like um, that the consensus support AI risk framework still remains elusive. So that's why we thought this is an interesting theme to do a prototype um, on. So uh, the first uh, policy prototype program uh, that was in Europe, uh, what, we, what we did was to co-create and test an AI risk assessment procedure. So differently from how uh, the European Commission has approached the identification of risks, namely through its white paper, we taught, we tested and co-created a different process um, that would uh, be conducted by uh, the AI developers. And we call this automated decision impact assessment. So this type of self-assessment is actually very similar to GDPR's data protection impact assessment, where the organizations that act as controllers are the ones that are in the best position to assess, determine, and document the level of risks that are raised by their own processing activities. And they're also the ones called upon to actually mitigate those risks um, accordingly. So our idea was to emulate what we have already in GDPR, not reinvent the wheel, and see how that works in the, in the world of, of AI. So following our proposal, we, we co-created two uh, important documents that we uh, then tested. One was what we call the prototype law. And this was the base document that was written like a law, you know, with recitals, with articles. It is obviously a fictional document, it is deprived from a binding or legal normativity, but the purpose is for companies to actually follow that, um, that normative document and get, and for us to get the feedback on how its content and, and format resonated with the participating companies. So we had the prototype law on the one hand, but then we also accompanied that document with what we call the prototype guidance. Um, we call it the, the playbook. And this would basically complement the prototype law and would serve as a sort of guiding document that could provide hands-on details to the participating companies on how to understand some concepts in law and how to conduct a risk assessment. So we included in that playbook a list of values that are relevant to AI and machine learning, um, a taxonomy of harms, and specific examples of mitigating measures. So we wanted to uh, give the companies the resources that they would need in order to comply with the prototype law. Very quickly, we, um, now going back, sorry. Uh, so we uh, tested this with 10 companies across uh, Europe, uh, and we tried to cover uh, key industries and services. So we had uh, healthcare and precision medicine, we had financial security, we had legal tech, and we had companies from Italy, Portugal, uh, Spain, uh, Germany. So we tried to make it as diverse as possible in, in geographical terms, but also in terms of the sectors that they would be uh, covering. So what did we actually ask the participants to do? So first we asked them to select an AI application. So a specific product or service that was powered by AI and machine learning that they were deploying in the market. 
uh, and, and a product or service that would produce you know, effects or have an impact on people. Secondly, um, we asked them to provide their initial feedback on the prototype law. So we basically asked them to simulate the implementation of the prototype law based solely on the text of the law. So we didn't give them the guidance, we just gave them the law. Um, after that, um, when we received the feedback on the prototype law itself, uh, that we then gave that additional guidance through the playbook. Uh, and we asked them to redo the simulation exercise, but now leveraging that additional guidance. And to understand how that taxonomy of, of harms, those examples of mitigating measures, how helpful could they be in conducting that risk assessment? And then throughout the, 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 the program, we uh, documented um, and observed their experiences. So we got all the, the insights that they had in testing both the prototype law and the playbook through their specific uh, AI applications. Given uh, the, the COVID situation, we had to do this uh, obviously in, in a virtual way. So we actually used what we call a mobile ethnography application through which each startup, each uh, representative would receive regular surveys and questionnaires through which we would get the feedback that we needed about the, the prototype law and the playbook. And we complemented this obviously with, with dedicated uh, workshops and, and brainstorm sessions. So uh, basically we wanted to test uh, three, um, three criteria, three important angles on, on normative documents. So uh, the level of understanding, the level of effectiveness and what costs or implementation would be involved. So one would be policy clarity. We wanted to understand if the norm addressee actually understood what was required uh, of them. The other thing was policy effectiveness. Did the prototype actually contribute to reaching or achieving the overall policy goal? In this case, to uh, concretely identify, assess, and mitigate risks posed by their AI systems. And third, we wanted to understand the costs that were involved in complying with a prototype, both in terms of time, but also resources. Did they have the right level of expertise that they, they needed in order to comply with the prototype law? So um, let's see how am I doing in time. So I, I'll be very brief i won't have time to go through all of the recommendations i'll just give you one or or two and this is uh, part of our report that that was uh, that was published but based on the results and the feedback that we got um on, on the prototype law and the playbook uh, there were a number of important um uh, recommendations uh that we listed on our report first would be to focus on on procedure instead of prescription as a way to determine high-risk ai applications so let me just spend a minute on this a prescriptive approach uh, tends to classify a priori a set of risks that organizations are called to identify. And it does so, it does so by stipulating an ex ante list of high risk applications and that are defined based on a specific criteria. This can be the sector, the intended use. So the prescriptive approach is in a way sort of like automatic. If a given AI application falls in that list, it will be considered high risk. The procedural approach works differently. It enables organizations to identify, assess, and mitigate those risks by following a number of steps. So indicative criteria and examples. So the procedural approach is not automatic. It is not directed at identifying also the risks, but also at taking care of their mitigation. So while the prescriptive approach sort of tells the, the companies where the risks are, the procedural approach tells companies how to get there. So one is more of a matching exercise and the other is more of a finding reflective uh, exercise. So instead of operating on the basis of this accented prescriptive list of, of what is high risk or not, we found that a procedural approach, a step-by-step -step process uh, in order to assess and mitigate the risk could actually do um, a better job at taking into account the specific context and impact of the proposed AI uses. It can also take into account the dynamic and iterative character of, of AI, where systems are continuously evolving and changing as, as a result of their interactions with uh, people and, and the environment. And the procedure approach also entails not only the assessment, but the, uh, the, the mitigation. The last uh, recommendation that I would just mention was the importance also of leveraging this procedural risk assessment approach to determine what is the right set of regulatory requirements that apply to organizations deploying um, AI applications. So rather than applying an entire set of regulatory requirements by default, and regardless of the type of AI application or its context or its actual risks, 
the procedural approach allows for a more balanced and appropriate apl application of regulatory requirements in response to identified risks. So uh, requirements around human oversight, explainability, rights of redress, monitoring, disclosure requirements, they can be better calibrated and understood what, are, what is the right mix if we follow a procedural approach that takes into account the context uh, of that specific risk that has been um, identified. So instead of assigning statutory requirements in bulk, uh, if we follow a procedure that actually looks at the specific AI application in question and has that reflective procedural approach to understand what are the risks involved, uh, we could get to a better um, outcome. So uh, I'll finish here. We uh, openloop.org is a website where you, if you're interested, you can find more information about the work that we've been doing, both the methodology and, and the programs that are um, on ongoing. And I'll, I'll stop here and I'll thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you very much to all the speakers for this uh, session. So we can now open uh, the floor for questions. So for all the participants, if you have any question, you can just uh, uh, post it on uh, a QA chat. And uh, so we are going to then read and uh, the question to the, um, to the speakers. So there is a first question to Professor Fisher. And uh, someone is asking whether it would be appropriate uh, as a mean to increase accountability, uh, especially in Europe, to have uh, EU public procurement laws imposing certain specifications for the products and vendors uh, in the public sector. And uh, the, the writer is also mentioned that Canada, for instance, has something similar. So IT vendors that are uh, selling to the governments need to have a specific uh, certificate of privacy assessment and, and so on. So um, I don't know if, uh, uh, yeah, Professor Fisher. I, I, uh, yeah. So I've turned my camera on, but okay. I'm not. Ah, there I am. <laughs> yes, uh, perfect. <laughs> Um, thank you. Um, it's, it's a really good question, and I think it highlights that when we're talking about institutional architecture, we're not, a lot of my paper was focusing on what goes on, on inside an administrative institution, but the way in which we govern now, a lot of that is connected to what goes on in other institutions within society, and while I haven't thought about um, procurement before it's a good example of that but clearly and and you know the discussion about the need to think about the role of professional scientists professional societies is another example of that but i don't know if um wendy and and pasky are also in um i don't know if they have any comments that they want to add i think you did a beautiful job <laughs> Um, can, can you hear me? Hello? We can hear you, Pasky. Okay, great. Yeah, so I actually used to work for the federal government, for the United States Environmental Protection Agency. And at least as far as we were concerned, whenever we outsource any kind of modeling development um, to an external contractor, there was a whole body of regulations governing um, the way that we purchased services and goods from federal contractors that we had to comply with. So that just was par for the course as far as we were concerned. Okay, thank you very much to all the, the speakers for uh, answering the questions. So we have another questions. Uh, that is um, to the last uh, speaker. So uh, they're, they're interested in knowing whether Open Loop get feedback, feedbacks about other stakeholders, uh, which are not immediately the companies participating in the prototype testing. So whether there are like the involvement of, for instance, NGOs, the consumer association, uh, or if it is something that is really just uh, company oriented. Uh, yes, that, that's a, a great question, and we're actually working in uh, having uh, better ways to involve other stakeholders, but we are already doing that to, to some extent. And the example that I would give is the program that we have ongoing in, in Mexico, where we are co-creating a, a governance framework for transparency and explainability. What sort of requirements should companies follow in order to render their 
AI systems um, more transparent and, and explainable to end users, but also to, to regulators or to other business partners. And there we, uh, we formed a group of experts with uh, members from, um, from academia and, and from civil society to actually have their input into the very own co-creation of the, of the governance framework. But this is something that as we expand, uh, we want to involve um, in, in a more sustainable way, stakeholders like NGOs, civil society, and also uh, academics. So good question, we're working on it, but there's more work to be done for sure. Okay, thank you very much. Mm, well, I do not see any other questions uh, in the chat, so I will use my privilege actually to follow on a bit on the last uh, question that was uh, asked, because I was uh, very, let's say, gathered and triggered about these experimental uh, policy uh, types of way to actually testing different uh, uh, regular, regulatory framework. And actually, as an economist, we have a very specific way to think about how to evaluate policies. So, and uh, one important thing is always to try to uh, understand which is, uh, let's say, the counterfactual. So, yes, you you can experiment, also you can do it in the lab, you can try to find the natural experiments and so on, but it's important when you evaluate uh, to see, I mean, against which benchmark, uh, exactly counterfactual situation, you can uh, evaluate uh, so different uh, prototypes in these uh, cases. So uh, maybe you went very, very quick and uh, so you had only 20 minutes so you couldn't enter in all the details, but I was wondering whether there is <clears throat> sorry, something similar uh, in this type of experimental uh, approach to uh, regulatory in, uh, in, in AI. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, that, that's a really good question. I didn't have um, a lot of time to go into the methodology, but this is something that is, is obviously still evolving and iterating. This, this idea of, of counterfactuals and how we can actually test different regulatory pathways or alternatives uh, is something that we would like to include in our in our policy prototyping methodology. So far, we've co-created what would be a consistent uh, governance framework, uh, but I think there is obviously room of maneuver to within the policy prototyping methodology to test uh, different provisions, different requirements, and see how they resonate in practice with, um, uh, with the, the companies that are actually building the, the technology. Another thing that could be interesting is uh, we could test uh, something that's uh, inspired by a draft uh, legislation. So we could we could think of if in the future when the, the proposal from the European Commission comes out of AI regulation to actually have on the one hand, the testing of a specific provision and on the other, a different take at that, um, at that provision. And I'm still complying with the same overall policy and legislative goals, but a different way to attain them. We could have a side-by-side policy prototyping methodology that could test uh, those alternatives and see uh, what kind of feedback we would get from, um, from each of them. So there, there is plenty of creativity that can go into this experimentalist approach. I like this idea of, of counterfactual and it's something that we've been uh, trying with and, and thinking of how to include in the, in the methodology. Well, I mean, finding counterfactual is something in general very, very difficult. Uh, I mean, it's more about a kind of mental exercises and then finding data to contrast, uh, uh, I mean, where you can measure and really finding a situation like that is not, uh, is not that easy. Um, but of course, I mean, it's something that is good that you, maybe you are thinking of uh, uh, to, to include in, your, in the, this uh, uh, new methodology. I do not see Ah, I see another question. So in the in the chat, so to the professor Brownsworth, um, they are asking. As you stated, we will never be too early when it comes to uh, to tech regulation. Is this mainly because of the nature of the debate that is too technical? Could you please give more explanations on this issue? I. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I've got that question. Thank you. Um, I don't think it's too technical. Um, I think if there are fears that the technology or te technology that's under development could have catastrophic consequences, then it's not too early to be taking a hard look at that particular uh, particular development. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's too technical, but. Um, it's very interesting the way that the, the um, 
Sorry. Uh, yeah, oh, you have video, yeah? yeah. Yes, um, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah, I just had a message saying you didn't have the video. I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, um, I would, but just an observation on the, the other contributions that came after mine. I, I was focusing on just one dimension of the problem of the right time to regulate and trying to emphasize that it depends how severe the concerns are that you do have uh, about inaction. I mean, and, um, and um, you know, some things are far more important than others. Uh, the issues arising on platforms, for instance, or within the gig economy, where they're mainly about level playing fields, or um, aren't, aren't you know, about catastrophes and dystopias. But on the other hand, if employees, workers rather, I should say, uh, are not being protected in the way we would expect under international ILO um, standards or you know human rights standards, then that is far more important. So, so the, there are different scales of importance in play, and I think that 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 influences how we should think about the right time to to, to regulate. But when I say the right time to regulate, so many of these other papers that we've had all the way through the afternoon are talking about, as Norberto says, not not so much. Uh, the hard intervention that's made somewhere down down the, down the line, but being prepared for that, and so you know strategies about prototypical law sandboxes, um, and even soft you know soft law measures are ways of trying to, uh, well in, in the examples that Norberto was given, are particularly ways about co-creation of regulatory frameworks between uh, industry or, or the technologists and and, and regulators, um, and. The, these are already, as it were, regulating um, uh, well, 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 well upstream. Um, so the other dimension, which if I'd had 40 minutes rather than 20 minutes to talk, I would have talked about would have been this dimension of um, the spectrum of intervention, starting with foresight, starting with foresight, then who makes the first response? And then we get to not, not a formal regulatory response, but just the first look at a thing scoping of it and then you could then you're into sandboxes and experimental governance and flexibility and adaptive mechanisms um and and then you get to a point where there maybe is a need for a hard legal or regulatory intervention um but if you've done if you've done the preparatory work well then that kind of intervention probably is you know is is, is again uh the exception rather than the rule and um yeah, uh, but I say, I think that to get the bigger picture here, you need to be thinking along two axes. One is about the severity of the, of the, um, well, the risks. Yeah, the severity of the risks. Are they risks to individuals, risks systemically, risks to infrastructures, risks beyond that to the global commons? You know, we talk about the tragedy of the commons. If that's what's at stake, we do need to be engaging with it as regulators very early on indeed, never too early. But then the other dimension, the other axis is, is, is about, the nature of the look or the nature of the regulation that's going on at the time, whether it's just having a hard look at a thing, scoping it, trying to figure out ways around the problems that arise for, you know, nascent enterprises that could do very beneficial things, uh, but need some relaxation of the of the standard regulatory framework. Um, and um, it could be harder than that. Uh, yeah, so, um, I mean, just the only other thing I'd say is that while all this is going on, while taking time in a co-creative spirit because intellectual property law generally carries on in its own sweet way and those who are doing innovative work will probably be able to get their innovations patented and otherwise incentivized in the ways that the IP system does regardless of whether in the end you think they are going to be beneficial or not. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bronsworth, for uh, your answer. We have a question here from uh, uh, Andrea, so I will leave the floor to him. Okay, thank you. My, my, uh, my question is Professor Cohen. Um, basically, uh, we have recently uh, uh, drafted a study for the European Parliament on the regulation of platforms, and uh, one of the major concerns we had when, it, when discussing that is that um, Platforms are so diverse, basically, and this is a recurring issue whenever you discuss technology regulation. When you use the term AI, when you use the term robotics, it, robotics, it was said multiple times over the conference these days. Uh, 
the, that is actually an umbrella term. It refers to such a broad spectrum of applications that are very diverse, and so are the incentives involved. If you discuss a platform that is a uh, 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 primarily intended to put two uh, parties into content in order to perform a transaction. It's a completely different issue than if you consider a platform that is instead delivering some forms of services directly to the user. You know, and so the, regulating them unitarily is a major issue, and I think it's something that is doomed to fail. So we are very much, and with, with our study that we drafted here with a, a, a center of excellence, we were kind of uh, very much in favor of a technology-specific approach, and we are typically in favor of a technology-specific approach that would force to break down the broader categories, so not discussing AI in general, but AI in specific applications, platforms, in different domains, distinguishing platforms that are uh, um, that serve different purposes. So, do you think? Uh, do you agree on this a need to have a technology-specific approach in regulating? Because the issues can be very different in our understanding, and also the incentive structures that you might want to provide to the different players involved. I think that if you conceive an incentive structure for. Uh, uh, platforms that are favoring transactions between peers, it's a, you, you need to uh, stress different things that if instead you're focusing on a platform that is de delivering services directly to the final user, or even just a, a platform that just allows people to publish their content and their opinions. So what do you think about that? Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I would agree. I would agree with that. Yeah. And, um, uh, and you can you can take this argument a step further uh, by saying uh, that in 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 those contexts where technology is applied uh, but otherwise not uh, very novel or um, yeah or sophisticated or uh, and or intransparent, you 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 may be able uh, to rely on on re regulations other than technology regulation. Uh, and that, that's, I think, now on the plate of labor lawyers uh, to see, uh, and also uh, competition lawyers, to see if, if within their apparatus they can find solutions to the problems that gig workers now face vis-a-vis -vis the platforms that, uh, that they rely on. Um, and on a different note, uh, I also think that, uh, that there is a uh, a trade-off in, uh, in, in, so Joe, I think the conference has mainly been about uh, maybe the, the somewhat larger firms and more established firms, but I look at, at, at very small uh, new uh, platforms in which uh, some grow big, but the market is still developing and should remain contested, meaning entry barriers should remain low. Uh, so that, for example, also cooperatives of workers can enter the scene, and we already see this happening. Uh, uh, and that means that uh, regulation uh, may not uh, may become too early, because if we now would start to regulate in a way that it's very hard to comply with, you basically entrench uh, the market position of, of established platforms, and you make it harder for alternative smaller platforms, local platforms, user-owned platforms like cooperatives uh, to enter the scene. And finally, um, yeah, there, there can be uh, interesting developments in how users may uh, leverage the GDPR, because if uh, GDPR allows uh, people to, uh, yeah, to claim uh, personal uh, data back and how they are uh, being used by a platform. Uh, and, and if users uh, claim this back uh, as a collective, uh, then they may be able to actually reverse engineer uh, some of these platforms, or at least to, uh, to, 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 to build their own platforms. So the space I'm looking at uh, is, is very, uh, it's very early days. Uh, but I, I support your, uh, let's say, case by case approach for, for, for this moment in, in history, at least. Okay, thank you very much, Kun, for your answer. So there is a, another question from the public uh, to Norberto Andrade. And uh, so a participant is asking, in your opinion, what is still missing in the policy prototype project where legal researchers co could contribute to? 
so someone that maybe is interested in, in Well, this is, uh, you know, it, it, it yeah, yeah uh, uh, I hope you can hear me now. Um, this is, you know, a project in an experimental governance that is an experiment in, in, in itself. Uh, we've, we've worked on, on policy prototyping as a methodology because we believe that it could complement other established experimental governance programs like regulatory sandboxes. What, what we've seen on, on AI and, and what was, I was, um, I was observing is that there was a lot of emphasis on, namely on AI national strategies on the importance and role of regulatory sandboxes on, on AI, but we were actually not seeing them being deployed. And the ones that we've seen now are, are regulatory sandboxes that are operating in the world of existing legislation. So normally a regulatory sandbox on AI, is at least the, the few that have been deployed are mainly focused on privacy and data protection. Um, and, and we think that in, in this spirit of, of experimental uh, approach, there is more that can be done. And that's why I think policy prototyping is a more kind of agile and, and, and versatile program where we can actually prototype and co-create um, you know, a new regulatory framework on a specific topic within AI. So it's, it will complement uh, the regulatory sandboxes that, that try to understand how existing legislation should cope with this new technological advancements. But why don't we actually complement it with an approach that actually co-creates a whole new regulatory framework for a specific topic in, in AI. So that was the gen genesis of the, of the open loop and, and the idea that we thought there was a gap to be filled. In terms of, of what is lacking, I mean, uh, there's plenty of, of, of things that, that, that we can do. Uh, we're uh, eager to work with, um, with, with researchers, with, with academics, with civil society that can help us identify um, topics, uh, themes that can look at our methodology and, and improve it and iterate it. We, uh, we are publishing everything that we do and, and analyze. So we want this to be something that can be built upon by, by others. But if people are interested in, in knowing more, uh, there's the website with all the information and feel free to, to get in touch with me if you have specific ideas or, or collaboration uh, opportunities that we could be exploring. Okay, thank you very much. So there is uh, another question uh, to Professor Kuhn Franken about uh, the coordination between general regulation and uh, competition uh, law. So they're asking, the EU with the Digital Service Act and the Digital Market Act is setting different thresholds for regulating online platform to really target big players. But the coordination with competition law, for example, the definition of market power is lacking. Is that a problem? How to coordinate general regulation and competition? Um, yeah, now we enter a, a more legal domain I'm less familiar with, but I do uh, understand why the European Commission is making this uh, distinction. Um, uh, the, also the uh, the main public interests uh, that uh, they see threatened are uh, are, are associated with these uh, with these uh, larger platforms and and they also um, let's say uh, are clearly uh, part of the European uh, legislative level. Uh, the platforms I look at, um, gig economy, uh, sharing economy, are local markets and externalities are also mainly local uh, and can uh, depend very much on uh, local, uh, the national labor laws or local municipality regulations. Uh, so in that respect, I uh, would favor uh, very much uh, the subsidiarity principle here and regulate uh, gig and sharing economy platforms at uh, national uh, levels. Uh, sometimes even lower levels and not uh, at the European level. Again, also uh, to make sure that local initiatives uh, uh, get, uh, get, um, yeah, ca can be fostered uh, in different contexts, but also to make sure that, uh, uh, yeah, let's say the valuations of these platforms and, and, and how we balance public interests are, are done at the lowest level as possible. Um, so that, that's, that's one, uh, one remark. The other remark on uh, the definition of, of, of and delineation of markets. 
I think that has become increasingly uh, more difficult uh, than in the past, even if also in the past economists uh, struggled uh, to, to statistically define uh, boundaries of markets as well. But now in, 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 in the age of platforms, uh, it's, it's, it's often bundle of services, they have quickly enter into uh, new markets. Uh, they can leverage uh, data in one market, in other markets, they absorb losses in one market because they know there will be gains in other markets. Uh, so, um, yeah, maybe the whole notion of uh, market power and delineation of markets on which traditional competition law uh, has been built, uh, yeah, is, 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 proves not, not so helpful anymore. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we do not have any other questions. It is about the time actually to uh, close this, uh, this session. So I would like to thank uh, all uh, the panelists, all the attendees. And um, we, after the break, uh, you can reconvene here for the last, um, for the last uh, uh, session of the day. So thank you very much. Hmm? In 10 minutes, so, sorry, they are telling me in? Sorry. So in 15 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, the next session will will uh, start. So you can reconvene in 15 minutes. So thank you much. Uh, thank you very much again, and bye bye. Bye bye, Adriana.
Hello, and welcome to the last session, the last panel of our 2021 Euro Conference on Regulating Uncertainty. It's really a great, great pleasure to have you all here with us, despite virtually. And we are about to start our last panel on uh, this very interesting debate around how to regulate AI. And this last panel is really last but not least We'll try to tackle the issue of AI in and versus global challenges. Um, unfortunately, uh, due to a personal COVID-related issue, one of our speakers will be missing today, uh, uh, Mihailis Kritikos um, from the European Parliament uh, STOA. Um, Mihalis is a dear friend and also a fellow to the Euro Center of Excellence, so it's, uh, it's really a pity that he cannot join us, but unfortunately it's for very serious reasons. So um, this will mean that uh, the conference probably will be a little bit shorter, or anyway, they will have a little bit more time for questions. Um, uh, still, uh, I invite you to participate to the debate by posing all the questions you might have on the chat and we will uh, uh, then direct them to the speakers with a small variation to the theme that we followed up until now, that is that uh, uh, we can start asking uh, questions to Professor Kockenberg right after his presentation. So uh, we will anticipate the debate around uh, uh, Mark Kockenberg's uh, uh, presentation right after uh, 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 he finishes his, uh, his speech. So without any further ado, I will leave the floor to Professor Palombella. Uh, 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 who is a professor here at the Scuola and also a member of the uh, Euro Center of Excellence that will lead this last panel and this last session for today. So looking forward to the discussion, I leave the floor and the word to Professor Palombella. So thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. So it's a pleasure to chair this uh, last but not least, as you said, panel uh, artificial intelligence in and versus global challenges. I mean, as the organizers say, the discussion on the, the level and timing of artificial intelligence regulation, the relationship between uh, law and ethics in shaping technological innovation, something that was tackled uh, in the previous panels, is of fundamental importance for assuring a good regulation. But now, uh, I believe that we are projecting all that in the light of the, uh, the global dimension, so global challenges. And what is the role that uh, AI can play in tackling global challenges? So this sounds even more timely and also timeless set of issues. Uh, the, the increasing global dimensions of legal problems, the, the, the fabric of law that is changed is much more interlegal. And the general strategies of uh, creating sector-related legal regimes, and at the same time, this uh, unavoidable interconnectedness among different fields in the legal and ethical sense, interconnected between, say, uh, trade and democracy or human rights and security or environment and the like. The, these things trigger further questions concerning the use and the structures of the AI. So the promise and also the dangers of AI are at stake on a level of complexity that should be carefully studied and analyzed. So Professor Kockelberg, uh, uh, promises uh, uh, a title about a global approach to the governance of AI. And uh, as uh, I uh, read from his subset, he will focus on the necessity of a global approach in the sense of a ultra, if I'm not mistaken, ultra territorial, not fragmented and geographical planetary extent of the term, which also takes into account the gaps between north and south of the world. But Professor Zmua uh, titles the why, what, and how of AI's global governance. And uh, as far as I can 
C, she will focus on a rather complementary but still different problem that is assessing the global approach meant as an approach not just referred to a single sector, separate field, like, uh, let's say, artificial intelligence in COVID pandemic. So a global approach to artificial intelligence vis-a-vis or uh, ad hoc or field related approach to the globality itself of artificial intelligence. So this is really a promising panel. And uh, I think it's real time for us to uh, give the floor to uh, Professor Kockelberg that uh, I simply introduced by uh, reading his qualification, he is Professor of Philosophy of Media and Technology at the Department of Philosophy, University of Vienna, and member of the high-level expert group on artificial intelligence for the European Commission. So, thank you very much, and please, Professor Kockerberg, your floor. Thank you for your introduction. I hope everyone can hear and see me. Um, let me pull up my PowerPoint. I will um, try to share my screen. I don't know. Mm, okay, for some reason it does not want to share the screen. Um, this is quite a pity. Uh, let me check if I can change that. Okay, what I will do is... Okay, that's a good idea, yes. Um, I will do that. That was uh, Francesca talking, right? Yes. Yes, I will... Um, share it with you and like this we can we can do that so it should be sent now you will see it um once uh, francesca opens Yes, I agree. Um, okay, so well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I'm, I should say that this is a conference, of course, where there are many speakers take a legal perspective. Uh, many people are lawyers. Um, I come to this as a philosopher, uh, in particular, a philosopher of technology. And also for, for this kind of team, um, I use also my background in political philosophy. So. Um, just had to give people a little bit of background of this. Um, I decided to talk about global governance. It's something that I've been busy with already for a while, also not um, only in the context of artificial intelligence, um, but also um, with regard to other, what I would call global crisis. Um, and um, as you will see in the presentation, um, I, I have some um, points there about the uh, importance of um, putting this discussion about artificial, <coughs> sorry, about artificial intelligence in the context of um, such global crisis also. Uh, so we have today, we have climate change that we feel we need to respond to also in policy and regulation. Uh, there's, of course, the global pandemic that's now happening. Um, and there are new technologies. And I should say that AI is only one of them. Um, there are biotechnologies that could have huge impact on the world, on humanity. Um, for example, technologies that change the genome, um, but also biotechnologies that enable to create um, bugs, uh, new viruses, for example, um, if we see what, what a natural virus can do to the world, then uh, this is now becoming much more 
um, I would say, much more imaginable imaginable threat, unfortunately. Um, and there are also older technologies, um, for example, nuclear power, um, that is also still um, in, important. So on the slides, you see the overview first. I sketch this global context. Then uh, I make my arguments and discuss objections. And I, um, I, I conclude. Um, next slide, please. So I sketched this global context so that one could say that there are existential risks for humanity, for the planet, uh, that we need to deal with. And um, all these, of course, involve also uncertainty, uncertainty about the future, technological uncertainties, technological risk. Um, and uh, I think it's good to, to see AI also in this broader context. Now, AI is usually seen as um, causing existential risks in the sense of becoming this huge um, uh, agent that takes over the world. Uh, some philosophers are seriously thinking about that. I believe that for the near future, in any case, we really need to focus on other dangerous ethical and societal impacts of AI and the, the, the risk of AI now. And, um, and we can do that, I think, without losing track of this global perspective. Next slide, please. Um, so part of this global context, when we then think about regulation, when we think about how to um, have a policy framework and legal framework to deal with these crises, including the potential implications of artificial intelligence, the problem is that we have um, a lot of differences between countries, between regions, also regions of the world, and also regions within nation states. Um, that all have uh, different ways to approach this. Um, and I, I analyze this in, in following categories. First of all, not to forget, I think uh, many, there are differences between countries in the way we pose the problem. Um, maybe for some countries, the um, uh, risks of artificial intelligence are formulated very differently. For example, collectivist cultures, uh, tend to formulate these risks as threatening a harmony of the collective, whereas in the West, people tend to focus on risks for individuals. Also, in terms of priorities, um, there are countries and regions that um, may have very different policy priorities. When, when I was uh, talking in the context of UNESCO, uh, one, one interlocutor said like, well, in, in you know, my country, I believe it was an African country, uh, we, we have other problems, for example, clean water, uh, and these problems are more urgent, right? So we don't think that artificial intelligence is the, uh, the most urgent problem to deal with. I think it's very important when we look at global governance of AI, to take that into account that people might have other priorities and not everyone agrees on what the problem is and how urgent the problem is. Um, the ethics then, um, ethics differs also. Um, I already mentioned individualist collectivists, um, generally more traditional societies uh, have also an, an ethics adapted to their cultural norms. Um, whereas societies that see themselves as non-traditional have also a tradition, of course, but uh, have other values, for example, individualist uh, values. So the, the challenge there is how to bring that together in uh, when, when we want to regulate at the global level, uh, when the ethics, the, in the descriptive sense, the, the, the ethics people have, the norms and values that people have when that differs. Um, legal systems also differ, um, of course, uh, between Europe and the US, for example, or Europe and, and China. Um, but even within Europe, there are differences. Um, and partly this has also to do with the different cultures that we have. We have different political cultures, legal cultures, and in, in general, um, social cultures in um, different societies. And the question that's of course related to the ethics also and and to the governance challenge uh, because the problem is that um, 
when we try to find principles that are common, um, it could be that some cultures don't see the value of certain principles proposed by other countries. Um, so this, these can all be barriers to uh, global governance and are challenges to overcome. Next slide, please. Now, I think that in general, um, these challenges are real. Uh, they need to be addressed. But there is a good argument for uh, responding to global crises, including technological ones like the ones uh, created by AI, um, to respond to these um, partly also in a universalist way and uh, by having um, an identification of shared problems, first of all. Think, for example, in the case of climate change, that that we identify a problem and say, like, well, this is not only your problem, this is our problem, um, or this is not only my problem, but we, we share this. And once we identify the problems, we can also then um, globally try to coordinate um, a collective response to this, um, or a similar response to this, at least, because the um, the idea is that um, when you have the global problems, you also have um, uh, you also need a, a global response to it. So that's the argument in general, and I think that's also true for AI. Next slide, please. So to the extent that AI raises global problems, so whatever other problems uh, might be raised by AI. Um, I think we need global governance of AI. And AI raises such um, global problems in a sense that its operations, so what it does, and its impact in terms of ethics and societal consequences um, is to a large extent shared and crosses borders. Um, so if we have problems of um, data protection, for example, this does not stop at the borders. If uh, Google or Facebook or Twitter have uh, certain rules they follow with regard to data protection or not follow, um, then this has consequences for, for us in Europe, for example. Um, so these problems, the, they, they, they cross borders. And um, also, if we think about the wider societal consequences of AI, uh, for example, the social consequences of automation uh, due to unemployment, um, due to replacement, but also um, the way we work that might change and so on. Well, this is also something that's not just happening in one place, but that's also a shared problem. And therefore, um, I argue we need at least some global governance of AI to, to tackle those shared problems uh, that we have with AI. Next slide, please. Now, the people who don't like global governance uh, can, can bring forward a couple of arguments against uh, this approach. And one objection is that um, many people fear that global governance means necessarily a world government and the end of the nation state. Now, I don't think that global governance necessarily means world government. So um, there are various degrees in which governance can be globalized. For example, currently we have international organizations, so not very supranational, not ultra uh, national, um, as uh, the professor said who introduced this talk. But um, also, um, I think we, we can have um, uh, international, so we don't need to go to the supranational level, perhaps. I personally think it would be a very good thing to do so, um, but global governance can take a lot of different forms. And I think it's once we say global governance, then we need to discuss uh, these forms, the precise forms that we think that global governance uh, should take. I personally find a federalist model quite attractive where you do have a kind of world government, but a world government whose tasks are restricted to um, to a very limited um, amount of tasks and, and uh, scope, um, but where where most of the um, uh, yeah other tasks are uh, can be done at other levels. 
And indeed, it's possible to keep different levels of governance. So uh, global governance doesn't mean that you necessarily abolish all the other levels. Um, and what I just said was not just federalism uh, as such, because it can go many directions, but was already federalism, um, keeping in mind the subsidiarity principle, which I think would be good to, to apply here. Namely, what can be done at lower levels uh, should be done at that level. Um, but if that's not enough, if that doesn't really tackle the problem, we should scale up to, um, to uh, national and global. Um, so in, in this case, with, uh, with AI, um, I would be really happy if uh, we had national legislation that dealt already with a lot of problems. Unfortunately, you know, keeping in mind this example of um, firms based in the U.S. doing things here, unfortunately, we, we really need to, to tackle such problems. And so I think then in addition to the national legislation we have and generally the governance we have, we need... Um, also global governance. So you can have different level, multi, multi, sorry, multi-level governance. Um, also, people who are afraid of the end of the nation state, I think um, this at least needs to be questioned. I'm not sure if it would be such a bad thing. It's, first of all, very relatively recent phenomenon in world history. Um, the nation state and also so far the nationalism combined with uh, modern technology um, and certain ideologies have really um, ruined a lot for us. So I wonder if, uh, if this is such a bad thing. In any case, it should be a point of discussion. Um, and it's not really necessary to abol abolish this. It's possible to have the different levels. Um, so this is uh, one reply to, to people who fear this kind of world government um, and, and related dangers. Next slide, please. So the second objection is a bit related to this world government fear and uh, says that global governance is undemocratic and leads to authoritarianism. Um, I would say, uh, reply again, not necessarily so. So just like nation states, there's always the challenge to build democracy if it's not there, to maintain it, to improve us, um, to, to improve a democracy. Um, but yeah, this is a challenge both at national level and global level, um, at all levels, I would say. It's also possible to have a, a very local dictator, and indeed there are many of them. So I think it's um, this is a challenge, but it's not a challenge that's unique to global governance. Um, we just really need to um, to think hard how to build democracy, and that's that's a huge philosophical, legal, and societal challenge. Um, but it's not one that can be put on only on the shoulders of the the uh, proponent of global governance. Um, in fact, then, apart from the normative question, authoritarianism today is often uh, caused by um, or significantly draws on nationalism. So nationalism is really um, fueling often authoritarian forms of govern uh, governance. Um, and we see that today, unfortunately, all over the world. And so I think it's very important there to distinguish um, between global governance and um, authoritarianism and also see that there can be a tension between global governance and nationalism. Then current international institutions um, for sure are not democratic. Um, the EU is not democratic enough. The UN is certainly not very democratic, um, but this is by itself, I think, is not an argument against global governance. It just means, again, that the institutions we have have to be made more democratic. And if we move more towards a supranational, um, then we really um, need to, to make sure that, that they are uh, democratic you know, legitimate in a democratic sense. And of course, what that means then opens up a Pandora box of, um, in, in this case, uh, political philosophical theories about democracy. And I think there's much work to be done still in policy of AI 
to um, to make sure that um, that we discuss this um, the influence of AI on democracy, but also um, the question of democracy in relation to governance of AI. Next slide, please. Global governance erases difference, identity, sense of belonging, including differences between legal approaches. This is really um, an um, yeah an objection that one finds very often um, from academics working on uh, topics such as difference and identity. Um, and uh, I think it's very problematic to use this as an argument against global governance. So I agree that, of course, um, global governance should not erase difference, identity, and so on. Um, but I think it should not be an argument against because we really have this need to uh, find a common basis in ethics and legislation for governing AI. And um, while this is a real problem, it actually also exists at all levels of governance. So from even small groups where you have different people with different identities um, until nation states and uh, the global level where you have these different cultures um, and so on. So I think the point is, is a good one, like let's take into account these differences, um, but the actual challenge is um, therefore for all forms of governance. Um, and in political philosophy and uh, moral philosophy, we have done these debates about universalism versus particularism, global versus local, um, debates about cosmopolitanism. And so I think we definitely need to find a balance. We need to um, uh, find a balance between the more universalist um, project of, of finding um, norms and values that, that you know, everyone can agree to and that can then be applied universally um, to AI in this case. And on the other hand, taking into account that um, different people, different cultures, different countries, different parts of the world um, have dif may have different priorities, may um, interpret things differently, may want to stress other values and so on. So this is, of course, a huge challenge, um, but it's a challenge that, yeah, that is there for everyone. And luckily, um, you know, philosophers tend to, to discuss this uh, at length, but um, luckily in spite of uh, philosophical problems there, which may or may not be surmountable, I do think they're even surmountable in principle, but they're definitely surmountable in practice because history shows us that it's possible on pragmatic grounds at all levels to bring people together and set up schemes of cooperation and institutions that go beyond the nation state and a particular interest of um, nation states. So it is possible and um, it especially happens in times of crisis. Um, and so if we see AI as crisis or as part of a crisis, then um, that's good news for this pragmatic um, argument. And it definitely happens before, um, especially relying on this feeling that we are all in this together, that again, sharing the problem. So I think global governance is possible when there is this shared ownership of the problem. Um, and this is something to work towards in terms of awareness if we want global governance. Next slide, please. So what we see in, in you know, think, keeping in mind this more pragmatic argument is that after World War II, um, the United Nations was founded in 1945. And uh, the way the, the UN describes this is uh, saying that after the war ended, nations were in ruins and the world wanted peace. And then representatives came together um, and for the next two months, they proceeded to draft and sign the UN Charter, which created a new international organization, the United Nations, and which was hope, it was hoped would prevent another world war. So here we have a crisis, in this case a war. Um, all parties recognized that this crisis um, was a crisis, that it was something that needed to be tackled, um, that the risk also needed to be tackled, uh, because when we're talking about technologies, it is often about risk. So 
um, and they agreed, they shared the problem, and then were able to find um, some common, um, not only some common hopes and, and a feeling like we need to do something about that, but, but also were able to find actually um, some principles which went in a charter. Um, and not only principles, but they were able to set up this new international um, organization. So when it comes to setting up a supranational organization, I think similar pro, um, process could uh, take place and would need to take place and could also rely on this kind of uh, process where first there's a crisis then there's a shared ownership of the problem and then we have um, the creation of a new institution and um, uh, policy governance framework. Next slide, please. So today, if that was the past, today we have this new global crisis. We have global problems such as climate change, which we feel, uh, many people feel need, we need to respond to. Um, we have the COVID-19 pandemic that um, we also have the feeling that we need to respond to. And we have those new technologies which are disruptive or are uh, seen and perceived as very disruptive now and in the future. So based on this kind of crisis feeling, um, there could be also a political um, move towards global governance, um, sensing that this is a good sign for change, sensing that, that there is momentum for this change. Next slide. And I think there are reasons to be optimistic to at least um, see some movement in this direction. Um, in a sense that there are um, existing global initiatives and ongoing work by at least by non-state actors. So even if many state actors, unfortunately, nowadays um, retreat onto themselves and do, uh, you know, no longer uh, fully believe in internationalization or, or don't get enough uh, political support for that, um, luckily there are many non-state actors who take initiatives, global initiatives, and um, for example, the uh, um, IEEE, the um, organization, um, technical organization that, that um, occupies itself, among other things, with global technical standards, um, those engineers and other people in this organization, they believe that a global initiative had to be taken on ethics of autonomous and intelligent systems. Um, and uh, there are also initi uh, other initiatives, for example, the International Congress for Govern Governance of AI, more recently ICGAI. Um, and um, there's also work in the context of, of COMAS in UNESCO. Um, so there, there are people um, both inside existing international organizations and outside um, NGOs that are active in uh, this area, um, it doesn't go in the direction of a supranational institution, but um, there is a shared recognition that some form of world governance is needed. Um, also, in general, in our societies, uh, I can speak here only for societies in the, in the West that I know, there is a growing awareness, especially among young people, that change is necessary in the face of transnational problems such as uh, climate change. Um, and so I think this is an opportunity to now, uh, for if, if we are convinced by these arguments, um, you know, to create momentum to, for changes um, uh, in policy towards more global governance. Um, so I think this this uh, this gives some. These are reasons to be optimistic because, in a way, uh, there is already something happening, um, and it's not just a matter of of dreaming or of uh, philosophical reasoning. Next slide, please. So to conclude, um, I have put discussions of global governance of AI in the context of how to deal with all kinds of global problems and crises. I think there's a good argument for global governance that I've provided. Um, if I look at the objections that are there now, um, they are quite weak. 
Um, so I think it is uh, uh, we can go ahead with this, and uh, especially um, it is something that's also feasible because it has already been done, um, at least to some extent, and there are ongoing efforts in this direction. And then finally, I think it's the, the right time, because if we look at the mechanism in the past, how this worked, how international organizations came into being, um, then, then I think this climate crisis, especially now, um, and also the worries around AI um, and the pandemic, I think they offer a unique historical opportunity um, for, uh, for doing this, um, for moving more in the direction of global governance, global governance of technologies and global governance um, of the global crises and uh, global problems that we face. Thanks. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hocker. It, uh, as I said at the start, it's a really uh, timely and timeless uh, discussion, uh, in truth. Uh, well, I, if I may, this is a, a general discussion about global governance that of course uh, includes artificial intelligence, this newcomer after all in this realm. And uh, you, I mean, rightly you raised the counter problems that global, global governance would hide or overlook uh, social, legal, ethical uh, differences in cultures and so forth. Uh, so uniformity might be uh, misleading. And nonetheless, uh, we need global regulation and governance of artificial intelligence. But we, uh, I mean, people know that uh, uh, what you suggest is precisely what happens in uh, many other sectors, uh, multi-level governance and uh, subsidiarity and so forth. It's already in place in uh, many, uh, so we can be even more optimistic in that sense, because it is in place in legal and global governance arrangements, say for trade, energy, uh, environment, uh, human rights, and uh, and so forth, and and so on. At least on the legal plane, on global administration, global administrative law, and so forth, we have a lot of experience, and uh, of course also a lot of objection. One of these objections is, of course, the undemocratic nature of these uh, global regimes. Uh, but, well, I think that the, the problem of democracy, well, of course, we should more, have more democracy everywhere, but the problem of democracy for this kind of uh, uh, global coordination uh, might be a mistaken problem, after all. Uh, I'm not sure that you would share this in the sense that the meaning of democracy at this level, uh, um, if taken from uh, the state-based kind of polities, etc., uh, would be out of place. And therefore, uh, from that point of view, what we should ask, even from global governance, well, that's my opinion, but that's also a question for the future, the, the, the upcoming discussion today, is uh, whether we should not, uh, we should be content with coordination, accountability, uh, revisability, uh, and the fairness of the relationship between the different levels, between the global and the regional or national or uh, lower levels of governance. And uh, so I, I, I agree very much with you, uh, apart from the fact that uh, uh, perhaps uh, we should not ask much about democracy on the global level of coordination, of global regulation, artificial intelligence, but hope more uh, in the fairness of and revisability of the relationships between the different levels that you were hinting at. But uh, as I said, it's a really timely, timely discussion. So thank you, thank you very much. And I think that uh, the next speaker will tackle uh, the same problem for, from a different perspective. And uh, uh, so we, uh, we should leave the floor to Professor uh, Natalie Jmoua. 
if she will appear on our video. And uh, she is a, a researcher uh, at the Kiyu Logan uh, Faculty of Law and independent expert in the Council of Europe's ad hoc committee on artificial intelligence and uh, OECD's network of experts in artificial intelligence. So, thank you very much. Natalie, you are ready? Okay, so I leave the floor to Professor Smuga, please. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. I'm not a professor, so I have to just correct you there, uh, but a researcher, but I'll take the title gladly. So, thank you anyway. <laughs> You're welcome. So I'm hoping the slide sharing works. If I don't hear uh, anything from anyone, I'm assuming it does, and I will just uh, continue. So um, I'm very happy to present to you today. Uh, and I think the presentation will indeed be very complementary uh, to what Marc uh, has just shown us. So I'm very glad that he already um, brushed away some of the objections against uh, global governance of AI, which, he think, uh, which I think he did very eloquently and convincingly. So that will save me some time. And indeed, um, my presentation will focus a little bit more on the global governance of AI as such. But as you will see, it will still be relatively broad. Um, so I will bring not just a legal, but also a bit of a philosophical perspective uh, to this topic. Um, so this is on the agenda in the time that is allocated to me. Um, basically, as you saw in the title of my presentation, I will focus on the why, the what and how of global governance of AI and global governance, meaning um, cooperation more generally. So this does not need to be only to limit uh, the risks uh, of artificial intelligence. It can also be on cooperating amongst uh, states and actors more generally to bring out the opportunities of AI. And my presentation will uh, heavily draw on three papers. Um, so I'm just putting it there for information uh, in case people want to read up more about it, they will find it uh, in these papers. So let's start straight away with the introduction. And there, I just want to do a short setting of the scene. Um, just a setting of the scene, let's say, of the societal paradigm that we are in today. And that is one where everything is quantifiable, everything is measurable, and we really rely on this measurability and quantifiability to try to control the world, to try to predict the world, and thus predict the future to gain control of it as much as we can. Um, and sometimes we overlook maybe that not everything can be quantified, uh, that there may be some intangible things that are more difficult to quantify. But we like to do so because it gives us a sense of control. And so we try to push it into a model, even if maybe there is no perfect model for it because it's not quantifiable. But it's a little bit the paradigm that we're in today. And of course, AI and big data is part of that paradigm, and we need to acknowledge that. So this is part of a broader um, paradigm, I would say, also that goes on with techno solutionism. You know, there is an app for that. It has become such a popular saying because there is an app for everything. Um, and we need to be very careful because here we come very close to the is odd fallacy. We all know that data is necessarily data from the past, right? And it's not because our app tells us that based on past data, this is how it is, that this is also how it should be if we look for the future, whether this is a descriptive or a normative uh, future, right? So we need to be careful about that when we are part of uh, this techno-solutionism um, approach. We are also marked by an increasing number of initiatives calling themselves in the name of AI for good, AI for social good, AI for common good, AI for global good, which all focus on these wonderful opportunities of AI, right? The idea is to use AI, big data, and AI, um, I'm not going to go into the definition. I did that in a previous um, uh, paper discussion, also here within the same group with uh, Santana. Um, but of course, it's mostly data analytics, right? You could say, um, and especially learning-based AI is hot right now, uh, more than rule-based AI, even though both are important. Um, and so the idea is to use this to analyze data in a faster way on a larger scale for good, 
at least that is how often um, it is also being sold as one that can bring us opportunities also at the global level, right, for global good. And that's all great. However, it's not because the goal of the AI system or the purpose is good that it's also designed, developed and executed in a good way. Right? You can have very great intentions of the goal of AI, um, but if uh, then there, for instance, is not taken into account the risk of bias or the accuracy um, of the system, then your AI for good will still not be as good as you hope it will be. So there we should not get too much carried away while recognizing, of course, the potential. And I think here we also need to reset maybe some of the expectations because we put so much hope um, on AI's opportunities and it will change and transform the world. And when this pandemic happened, this was the first idea, right? That, oh, but now we have AI, so we will be able to you know, solve things much faster. And while, of course, AI did play a role in some of the solutions that helped ease our lives during the pandemic, it has not been a miracle solution uh, that is now, you know, dealing with uh, climate change as well as with fighting pandemics and doing all these other miraculous things that are sometimes assigned to it. So I think COVID-19 has also shown us that there is a lot of potential to cooperate on the exchange of data, on the exchange of algorithms that can be used to peruse the data for a good uh, purpose, but maybe not as much as we had hoped. So we need to be realistic there. Um, but it did make the need for global cooperation on AI, as well as a ton of other issues, more pressing. Um, so that is where I want to make the case that um, why now we need uh, AI governance, global governance? Well, let's start with why AI needs governance. I think by now it is well known, right, that AI brings certain risks along with it. I'm not going to go into the details of these risks. Um, they, they are now also very well known in the media. Um, but so this is one of the things where, you know, governance might be needed and AI is not alone in that of course right it's a it's a type of technology in fact a set of different technologies that fall under this umbrella term and like all technologies it can shape society right it is shaped by society so by the humans that create it the institutions in which it is created and used uh, the values of society in which it is created and used but it also shapes society in turn and while this is the case for any technology, uh, I'm, I'm reading Hannah Arendt currently, so the example she gives, for, for example, is the watch. When the watch was invented and became more widespread, it really changed our way of lives as human beings, the way we dealt with time, the way we dealt with each other. It had a huge impact on us, even though it's a relatively basic uh, type of technology if we compare it to very complex algorithms. Um, and so AI, maybe differently than other technologies, because of its features, might have an even bigger a potential to shape our society and to shape us. And the tricky part is that it can also do so deliberatively, or rather it can be used to do so deliberatively in ways that we don't fully realize. Um, Karen Young calls this the hyper-nudging uh, of data-driven uh, systems and AI. Um, so this is something um, a bit further going. And of course, it's not that there is a legal vacuum. There are already governance mechanisms to tackle these risks that exist today. Um, but there are some legal gaps. And you could ask yourself, but is there anything new under the sun? In the sense that I just said, all technologies uh, have a shaping influence on us. So what makes AI so radically new? Can't the current laws that deal with other new technologies already deal with AI? And I think to some extent they can, and already to a large extent they can, but then there are certain specific features to AI. Um, for instance, the opacity uh, of certain AI systems, not all. And that matched with the fact that we do delegate a human control and authority exceedingly to these opaque systems. Um, that is something, you know, that is a little bit unusual. And if you couple that then also with the scale on which you can um, not just develop, but also put AI in operation, um, this scale and speed is also something uh, interesting to keep in mind. And then last, of course, is self-learning ability uh, that is often mentioned. So I'm not saying that because of that, 
you need to have necessarily an AI specific regulation. But I do say that there are some features um, with the use of AI um, that warrant maybe further investigation when you talk about governance. Now, why should this governance be global, or at least in part be global? Because I don't think that everything necessarily needs to be dealt with globally. Well, Mark already did the, the work for me there, so I can be very brief on that. Um, of course, we live in a globalized world, right? And we have an interdependence uh, of economies and societies. There is no way around that. Um, there is an effect, right? Um, as as Mark also said, the impact of AI, whether it's positive or negative, it does not stop at the national border. There are cross-border effects or externalities, if you like, and these need to be dealt with on a more uh, global scale. You cannot just keep that to the nation states. Now, the question is, of course, how global is global? There are not that many truly global initiatives, and they don't necessarily all need to be global because we need to be, as Mark also said, very mindful of potential local differences. Um, not every uh, country is at the same speed and has the same needs. So, and of course, we're not just talking about countries when we talk about cooperation on AI's governance. Uh, it's not limited to state actors, right? Um, the current initiatives that we see count a lot of different actors from the private sector, also NGOs, from the public sector, so civil society organizations as well more generally. Um, and these all have a role to play in this. Um, now, if we look at these actors and how they stand into relation with each other in the context of um, AI governance and cooperation, there are different possible relationships. Um, and this um, I draw from industrial organization literature. You have one of competition, cooperation, and then the mix of competition, right? Or cooperative competition, as it is often called. Um, so in competition, of course, actors stand in competition with each other with regards to AI. Um, so they care mostly about, well, competing against each other, being the first, being the leader uh, in the AI landscape. The move to cooperation, I think, is slowly happening. We're not fully there yet. But in cooperation, you basically eliminate competition as far as possible. Um, and you try to really join forces to work towards similar goals. And then there is this in-between cooperation, um, which is an interesting one, because in a, let's say, free market uh, liberal society, you do have also a role um, for the market, because the, the ideology behind it is that there is some beneficial socially beneficial innovation that you can get from a free competitive market. So you might not want to fully eliminate competition, but you might want to set a base layer of cooperation, cooperation in the sense of adopting maybe common rules, a set of level playing fields with common rules that you all agree on. And then on that uh, layer of rules, you can have competition. Basically, once you agreed on the rules of the game, you can play the game and have competition, but you first need to agree on the set of rules. So that is a little bit the idea behind it. And today we are still in uh, the overemphasis on competition. And you have the, all the rhetoric around the race to AI. And if you see the national strategies on artificial intelligence, they're all about winning the race to AI, right? And this is, of course, a big problem if you want to move towards a paradigm of more cooperation or cooperation in AI. And the problem with this overemphasis on competition is that you focus only on the state's own interests, assuming even that the state gets its interest rights. Because of course, within the state, you have various different actors who each have their own interests as well. But this often leads to protectionism, protectionist policies that are not necessarily serving um, nobody's uh, well-being in the end, because in the long term, everyone will lose. Because you'll have a disregard also for the negative externalities um, of, of AI, of the use of AI in an irresponsible manner. And the idea is that if you only focus on your own interests and you take this as a race and a competition where either you have a winner or you have a loser, it's a zero-sum game, in the end, everyone loses. 
because um, it's not a finite game. A, in AI, if you deal with it properly, if you ensure some cooperation, you can really use those benefits to make sure that everyone can benefit from it. But for that, you have to move away from this mindset of winners and losers and also try to establish some trust among the players so that you can have some longer term stability around which you can develop then those benefits for everyone. If you take the zero sum game approach, in the end, we will all go less far than we could have gone together and everyone will lose in one way or another. Some will lose more, um, but that's a little bit um, how this game works. So it's in the collective interest to work towards at least some form of competition. Um, now, moving to the why, um, there are some challenges uh, that we need to deal with, right? Um, because it's, it's easy to say we need to move towards cooperation uh, or at least competition, but it's not that easy if you then look at now doing that globally. And it's not just an issue for states, even within organizations, you have departments that compete with each other and that don't like to work with each other. It's a, it's a bit of a human thing. So it's not just on the level of states. Another difficulty is that the scope of AI is not always clear. Uh, countries have different definitions of AI, different understandings. AI experts have different definitions of AI. So I'm not saying that this definitional issue is necessarily a huge problem. But sometimes it does uh, lead to some miscommunication. And uh, the stability of cooperation always will depend on the underlying motives uh, that push the cooperation further. And there we can have an issue um, between two levels of competition. As I said, if you have competition at the level of the market, that is relatively okay as long as you have co cooperation on the rules that govern that market. Right? And if we look, for instance, at the European Union, you have some clear market rules uh, in terms of how uh, competition should be approached. Right? It should be fair. Um, and so you create um, uh, an environment of healthy competition, and that is the one that you want. Um, and so in that sense, that can be okay. However, if you go more to a global scale, you often see that we're not just competing on the market, that it's not just market products. Uh, at stake, but it's also at the level of values. Um, and if there are different underlying values for the competitors, it's much more difficult to get to your level playing field that sets the rules of the game. Um, and that is something that we see very clearly with AI if we look at the big players uh, on the AI market, so to say, uh, at global level. You can also have different priorities. And here I come back to the issue that different states are a different level of not just AI implementation, but digital infrastructure implementation in the first place. Um, so they will have different priorities when it's about cooperating around AI. Um, and there's also more than just AI, right? There's so many pressing issues as, as Mark also explained. So you would need to create some momentum, which I think there is right now, but but still, there are resources that go into cooperation mechanisms with others. And so the social and economic conditions of these different countries will need to be considered. Now, if we set aside all these challenges and we take the positive outlook that Mark ended his uh, presentation with, what is now uh, the pressing need to cooperate on? Um, you might want to prioritize because, as I said, setting up cooperation mechanisms, especially at state level, but also just more generally, is resource intensive. And so the idea would be that where there is an increased risk of harm for AI, you would probably want to have increased cooperation. And uh, ideally, if our goal is to have the opportunities of AI, so the socially beneficial innovation, you want to create a level playing field, a set of common rules based on which you can then compete. And um, in, uh, in one of the papers that I mentioned earlier, so the idea would be to broaden the current gaze of regulators because there are uh, initiatives to look at governing or regulating AI. Uh, at European level, at the level of the Council of Europe, UNESCO, OECD, there are many initiatives. Um, but often um, they are focused on AI as such. So we, we need to start moving from focusing on AI as a system 
towards AI as a socio-technical system within a socio-technical environment. Um, probably for the people that are present here, they already uh, have this notion of socio-technical systems, but for regulators, this is something that they're catching up with. So AI is always embedded in a broader environment and you need to take that into account. It's not about regulating a system, it's actually about regulating the processes and the actors that are within that environment because they are influencing the AI system. The second broader move is from looking only at AI systems to looking at AI systems, but also at data and digital infrastructure at the same time. Because these environments of AI systems, the environment of data and of digital infrastructure are interwoven. These elements reinforce each other. If you don't have the underlying digital infrastructure, you cannot run your AI application. If you don't have the data, you cannot run your AI application. So these hang together and uh, it's probably a mistake to think that we can just focus on AI systems and making AI systems trustworthy without also looking at, but how do we govern data at a global level? And how do we govern digital infrastructures at a global level? And with digital infrastructures, you can also, for instance, think of platforms. Um, big platforms, they can be market platforms, there can be uh, social identity platforms on which AI systems run, on which data is collected. This hangs together. Uh, however, today regulators still tend to focus a little bit too much just on the systems and not on this bigger picture. And then the last uh, broader move we need to make is to move from a more individualistic perspective that we have today um, to one that also includes a societal perspective. Um, let me explain. I think today we are mostly focusing on the way AI can impact human rights or fundamental rights. Uh, and that is, of course, important. And it's also, um, there is already a lot of literature around that in the sense of we know that AI can hamper, for instance, the right to non-discrimination or the right to data protection. And we increasingly are able to map this and also identify individual harm that goes along with that. But this has limits because sometimes the problem is a systemic uh, problem and not necessarily one that just affects one individual. And as long as you keep focusing on individual rights and individual remedies, you will not be able to tackle those bigger infrastructural problems. Um, and here um, I often make a distinction between individual interests, collective interests and societal interests. So individual interests can be affected by AI. For instance, um, Let's take the example of an AI system, uh, an algorithm on social media that directs you towards certain harmful contexts or misinformation or tries to manipulate uh, who you will elect that can be harmful for your own interest because you're being manipulated. The example of an AI system that misidentifies you um, with facial recognition because your skin color is darker, that affects your individual interest. An AI system that impacts your dignity at work, for instance, or maybe is being used to replace you or at least transform your work in a way that uh, affects your interest, we can see that as an individual interest. Collective interest is what I call um, when this happens to a group of people, right? The group of people that are affected by the specific algorithm online. The group of people with a darker skin color that pass through that street where the AI system misidentified them, and the group of people in that one organization where the algorithm affects their work. But all of that looked at together also affects a societal interest, because even if I don't have a darker skin color and I'm not affected by that, as a member of society, this is a problem, that there is this inequality in the society that I live in. It's a problem that people are discriminated against. It's a problem if people are manipulated uh, electorally, because then whomever will be elected will also have power over me. So, and this is a little bit what Mark said, I think, but in different words, we need to move towards realizing that, as he said, these are shared problems. So I call that a societal interest, which goes above and beyond mere individual interests. And today there is still a bit too little attention for that. Now I'm mindful of my time, so I'll, I'll move a little bit faster, but an analogy here can be made to environmental, um, environmental harm, which is also a societal interest because it affects not just individuals, but society at large, including future generations. And individual remedies or fundamental rights will not be sufficient to tackle that. 
right? So you need to work towards different approaches. Um, so there, um, the proposal would be to move along uh, two axes, right? The first is a horizontal dimension of governance, including AI, data, and infrastructure. And again, I'm not here talking about necessarily having one overall sweeping AI regulation. There are many different technologies falling under that, but it's important that um, you deal with the risks uh, that are part of that, um, that are uh, brought along with that, and that you also take into account the risks associated with the data and infrastructure that go along with it. And then the second axis would be this vertical dimension, where you can focus also on cooperating around specific beneficial uses of AI, cooperating around specific applications that are very problematic, think for instance of lethal autonomous weapons, and areas of significant risk, and then cooperation around ad hoc issues. And COVID-19 is, for instance, one of these ad hoc issues where AI can play a beneficial role and where cooperation can be useful. Now, as to the how, um, there are different pieces of advice uh, that, that can be given, so to say, and it's, it's tricky business. Um, I think many initiatives are already jumping into the scene of trying to come up with governance rules for AI. But first of all, they will need to balance the speed that is necessary because AI is already everywhere. So inevitably, you already come a little bit late. They will need to balance that with being as comprehensive or holistic as possible. Because remember, I said there's also data and infrastructure. But at the same time, also being contextual because the same AI system does not raise the same risks in each and every context. And these three don't always match with each other. The second point that they'll need to do, uh, these cooperators, so to say, is to clarify what is the value system of those people cooperating. Because as I said earlier, if you don't share the same set of values underneath, it will not be a stable cooperation. And there it can help to build on existing cooperation structures rather than inventing new or setting up new mechanisms or new organizations to deal with that. Because these existing structures already have processes in place that can maybe help you take the work a bit faster. And of course, they have overlapping mandates. If you think of UNESCO, the Council of Europe, uh, the European Union, they're all now looking into regulating AI at different regional and global levels, but they are interacting with each other. So they can create a sort of network of networks where they exchange knowledge and information and try to move towards, let's say, the best possible set of governance mechanisms. But at the same time, you can't all go at the same speed, and that should be okay too, right? So I call this variable geometry, differentiated cooperation. These are well-known terms also in the EU, and that's okay. We need to be mindful of power imbalances because not everyone at the negotiation table will have the same power to have their voice heard. And that is not just within an organization, but of course also between countries. Um, and ensuring a feedback loop that whatever cooperation mechanism you put in place to govern AI, that you can adjust where necessary based on the feedback. So moving now towards my conclusions. So we need to let go of this myopic view on just looking at AI systems and go a little bit broader and look at AI in context. Not just look at fundamental rights impact, but also look at the broader societal impact and how we can govern that. Truly global approaches are today still missing, or at least they're missing teeth, right? They're still, there's not, a, let's say, a binding global regulation on AI, and that will probably not happen anytime soon. But it's also not always desirable. Um, we know that legal gaps need to be filled, but it's very important to acknowledge, also for lawyers, that the solution will not just come from law. Uh, law has its limitations, it has its role to play, but we also need, for instance, a public debate on the role of AI in society and, and create a long-term vision. And you can't just enforce a long-term vision with laws either. Um, this requires things like sensibilization and education. Um, you will need resources if you set up oversight and enforcement mechanisms, because just putting them in law without the resources to back that up will also not take you very far. And most importantly, we need to lose this race to AI mentality and move towards a mindset where we know that we're not in a finite game, but an infinite game, where if we cooperate at least a bit more, everyone can win in the longer term, or at least not lose. 
Um, and maybe just to, to finish uh, with an important uh, call for responsibility, however we act or don't act today uh, with AI, because of this impact it has on our society, it will define the shape of society for generations to come. This is something we cannot avoid. So this is a, a sort of collective responsibility we all have, I think, and especially those regulators that are supposed to cooperate with each other to make sure that the shape uh, that society will have aligns with the values that we want to protect. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. So thank you. Thank you, Natalie. It's, uh, uh, well, I perceived your presentation as a, a manifesto for the future. <laughs> Was I mistaken for that? It's, uh, I, I appreciated it. There's a, there are a lot of uh, important recommendations for well, a prosperous future of artificial intelligence. But I, I also saw something uh, that was underlying uh, your thoughts. And the, the, there is a, a consideration you made uh, that I noted most. It is uh, the mutual shaping between technology and society. And uh, so I was thinking, of course, it's not mere rhetoric. Uh, there is something behind uh, that you were hinting at. And I wonder what was that. Um, we have hundreds of uh, global governance regimes, as I said earlier. Um, so we regulate uh, health, uh, trade, forests, energy, and so forth. So different sector-related regimes, water. So I have a question for if we will have time later. That is, is regulating artificial intelligence something like regulating health, trade, forests, uh, water? Or is it something different? And in your consideration, mutual shaping between technology, that is artificial intelligence and society. Perhaps you were meaning that. That is, that uh, I take it like this, that artificial intelligence is something pervading an operational structures, cross-cutting uh, any of those realms. So, because it's, because it is our fundamental infrastructure of action. And that, of course, raises a lot, increases a lot the level of our responsibility toward artificial intelligence. And if I take this point of view, I also can take your uh, manifesto and uh, of good things to do and uh, to analyze as uh, very important in that direction. Yes. But this is not my turn. Therefore, I have no turn in truth. Uh, so I think that we should uh, step forward with the questions that I'm sure there will be, there will be many. So Francesca is the reader for us. True, Francesca? Yes. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you, Professor Palombella. And of course, thanks to Mark and Natalie for their presentations. Uh, because it was an extremely interesting panel, um, we also have, we do have quite a lot of questions. Um, they're all very interesting and engaging, but for the sake of time, I, uh, I hope that the audience will not mind, but I will slightly reformulate some of them and maybe combine them. Uh, so right now I see five questions and I'll take three together as a sort of um, single kind of <laughs> single uh, question to be addressed to both Mark and uh, and Natalie. So um, I'll consider that as a question divided in three different points. So the first uh, comment is basically 
that um, you know, while we're having this, uh, this panel in this very moment, the US Pentagon is delivering a live press, press briefing on its AI strategy and its position vis-a-vis -vis China. And it's openly declaring its intention to become AI dominant uh, by uh, 2030. So with this kind of setting in, in mind, how is uh, cooperation globally working and uh, how can you what is the role that Europe can um, play within uh, this debate can it have a um, vital role how can it have a vital role in creating the ground for a cooperative global playing field where AI may have a truly positive effect so that would be the first uh, element and the second element is that um, normally Cooperation is seen as um, sometimes it as has both pros and cons compared to uh, competition because um, on the one hand um, it may forces the washing uh, of the relevant principles and the different values that um, different uh, communities um, share and. Uh, this may be particularly problematic in the US European debate, but at the same time, um, competition may be um, particularly fruitful because it allows the creation of different uh, models, but can also allow us to cherry pick some of the preferable solution. So, is against this um, framework cooperation even possible? Uh, beyond mere appearance and the very last point and then I'll stop is against this picture again uh, if we try to keep the values between the different cultures what is the dialectic dialectic ecosystem that allows that um, uh, this cross-cultural scale debate to be uh, possible and eventually converge in a um, unique um, and convergent direction. Uh, so I'll stop there. I hope that that was clear. Um, and I would, um, it's, it's up to you who go first. So either Mark or Natalie, do you want to address this question? And then we can move on to the last two questions. The, the, uh, the competition question sounds like a question for Natalie. I, I can I can try to tackle um, some of the points indeed. Um, so good to know uh, that the Pentagon is uh, <laughs> developing its strategy, and indeed, uh, already in 2019, right, uh, the U.S. had promulgated an executive order in which the language of domination in the AI field was very clear. Uh, and in China's uh, national strategy of 2017, the domination strategy, we want to be leading in this field, was also very clear. So that's what I refer to. And it's true that it's very difficult in such a, in sh in such a setting to try to move towards cooperation. And Europe is maybe a little bit a strange one there, because, of course, Europe also wants to lead in the AI uh, field and in the European strategy on AI that is being set. Um, but it also uh, will be the first uh, major region to come in just a few weeks' time with uh, an AI regulation, or at least a proposal for an AI regulation. And so far, nobody will have gone as far as Europe. And I think there, um, what Europe uh, would like to put forward, and I mean, they've already reached out their hand to the US to cooperate on that and to other like-minded countries, uh, as they said, is to try to uh, show sure there can be competition, but let's first agree on these basic principles based on which we can cooperate and then on that level have our competition. Um, and Europe will try to also play a bit with its, uh, well, 400 to 500 million consumers that it has, because if US companies want to deliver their AI in Europe uh, or export it, they will need to abide by the European rules, and the same will go for China. So that's where um, Europe will probably try to play a role, and it will be in the mutual interest, probably, of these countries to work together on this minimum level of rules 
and establish a trade relationship where they can trust each other and trust their AI systems, uh, operate in a safe manner, in a trustworthy manner, so to say, um, and then based on that have competition on, on, on innovative um, solutions. But it sounds very nice in theory, and that's um, where the aim is probably, but I, I agree probably with the person who asked the question that it's, it's not a very easy thing to do. Um, and then as to the point that cooperation may also wash away uh, the values um, at, at local level, I think we need to be very mindful that you should not uh, go for cooperation at any cost. Right, uh, so it's very it's it's important to try to strive towards a global consensus when it comes to, especially when it comes to mitigating the harmful effects of AI. Uh, think about the military, but also think about you know disinformation in times of pandemic. It's in the interest of every country uh, that this pandemic is uh, is being dealt with and that people don't have misinformation on it. Um, but at the same time, there is no need, I think to strive towards cooperation if in practice the rules that you can agree on in the end don't mean anything anymore. Um, so you need to still maintain a minimum level of, of proper rules that protect at least the values that you stand for as a society, otherwise you will lose. Um, and that is also not, uh, not ideal. But I don't think that you need consensus on each and everything. If you look at just a, a member state like Belgium, for instance, uh, so that's where I'm from, it's a very pluralistic society as well. You have different regions, different languages, but it can still work in a democratic way in respecting the rule of law. So it's not because you have different cultures and different maybe expressions of values um, that you cannot come together and agree on a common set of rules. You don't need to have fully unified uh, sense of values in order to do that. And I think the, the richness of values can also be an, an enrichment for, for, the, for the cooperation system. So I think I, I answered more or less the questions, I hope. And I'll stop there and maybe Mark uh, will want to say something more. Well, I just want to add to that, that um, I think that the, the the differences should not be exaggerated also um there we are all humans on this planet and and uh, we have certain needs and certain values and so on and i i think uh, we can i agree that we cannot we should not agree on everything um that's not necessary but but uh, we can agree on some basic principles that uh, that are there for all humans and and in in fact we do and uh, if you see how if i look to discussions of uh ai ethics and and i see for example china and the, and uh, versus western values i i think the the emphasis is definitely different but um there i also see a, a big overlap and it's on the basis of the overlap of ethical uh, values that that we can work okay thank you very much um actually uh the audience is pushing a bit more on that because we have another question that is kind of getting again on the um, differences, let's say the, the cultural differences and the um, feasibility of the global governance of AI. So um, that's specifically directed to Professor uh, Kuckelberg. And um, so the question is uh, connected to the fact that um, global, this global governance of AI is really much a response to shared problem, even though the ways in which we pose those problems are often uh, different uh, among each other. And uh, AI is seen as an ideology and not just a technology. Uh, so against this picture, um, in, in the question, we are um, considering that the case law of Supreme Courts related to tech issues uh, are already um, seeing different values competing and conflicting with each other. Again, the um, kind of court, the uh, debate between the US and the European approach is really much exemplified here. So. At the, uh, at the end, the question is, is it possible to imagine an efficient global uh, governance? And of course, they are uh, thanking you again for your amazing presentation.
I think you're muted. Okay, my microphone is on now. Uh, thank you for alerting me to that. Um, yeah, I think it's a, a very broad question. Um, it, it goes again about this, uh, these values and so on. I, I'm not sure I can say much about that. Um, I think it's, uh, I think one would need to have a more specific question. Okay, so um, I actually see that there is another one which I think it's directed to you again. There is no specific uh, indication, but I think that it's directed to you, Mark. But of course, Natalie, if you want to jump uh, in on that, you're more than welcome. So um, against all these um, problem, what do you think that the role, again, I'm, I'm kind of rephrasing it um, here a bit, but what do you think that the role of self governance could be? Could it be um, a new and better governance model? And a, uh, I think that from the perspective of the, of the, um, of the person who's posing the question here, um, this could actually be seen not just as a matter of issue, but also as having almost a philosophical kind of uh, background and, and value, because in this sense it can be seen very much as an expression of both private and public um, autonomy. Um, so in the end, the speaker is asking whether uh, we are not a bit too fixated with the um, paradigm that interrupts the transmission of subsidiarity all the way down to individual and also the uh, psyche of the individual as well. Um, and whether, again, we should not emphasize a bit more this linkage between the individual self-governance and the external, local, national and global governance. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. I think all levels are important, right? So also, uh, it's definitely very important what individuals experience and uh, how they understand their autonomy and, and what they want. Um, so uh, that's, that's for sure. What I think what I would like to, to um, say on this question, how should the, the governance look like, is um, I would like to start from the existing institutions uh, that we have that are international. Uh, where we see that that there is among the people that uh, lead these institutions and among many of the, the, the diplomats and, and representatives of the countries, there is a, a broad consensus that uh, that there could be more global work uh, done. Um, but but often the nation states they they, uh, they put a break on on giving away too much of their, uh, their own autonomy to these uh, institutions. Um, and I think that's really, uh, for many things that, that's okay, but when it comes to global crises, I think the, the only way to deal with it is by giving some of that sovereignty and autonomy away. Um, and the same can be argued at individual level, that as a default, uh, we should all decide about our own life and so on, but, but we, we have this legal system where we put limits to that um, in, in certain cases. And in a normal life, you normally don't have a problem with that. But in certain cases, it, it is very good, I think, that, um, that the individual is not, doesn't have the last word um, in, in case when there is a murder, for example, and the same uh, with when states um, misbehave or when they do not take action at all against climate change or, or uh, for governing AI, I think it would be good to at least agree on, on a few um, very general principles uh, that are applied widely and globally. Um, and in this uh, domain, in a, a specific domain, take away some of the sovereignty of the member states. Um, how exactly the balance needs to be between um, what I would then call a kind of federal level and uh, global level on the one hand and, and lower levels is of course uh, uh, up to political and democratic decisions. And, and I think we should not um, we should not have a dictatorship doing that, um, but it, it is something that, that I think that, yeah, is the only solution to the, to the, the problems we have. So, so no. 
Yes, uh, being here, I, I, I will just have the privilege of asking my question directly to, to both speakers, to Mark and Natalie. Um, so the, in this panel, we're discussing the global level, and it's very relevant. But as Natalie was recalling, just in a few weeks' time, we'll have uh, a proposal by the European Union on how to regulate artificial intelligence. I'm very curious about what that will tackle. I think it might address liability. There has been so much discussion around liability, uh, and we also participated in that discussion. But uh, to some extent, I, uh, if we just go back to 2018, when basically the, 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 the Commission really made a step forward and said, we want to have a European approach to artificial intelligence, I was enthusiastic about that idea. Because I'm a European citizen, I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of the EU. I think it's an ideal level of governance because it's supranational, but it's not really global. And I think that many things can only be really effectively regulated at that level. But then, if you look into the work of the uh, high-level expert group, which is interesting, it, it's very similar to many other uh, uh, initiatives happening at uh, very high policy-making level, OECD, Council of Europe, so on and so forth. So, uh, and then competing models, China, uh, US, and, and you name it. So among this proliferation of supranational, let's simplify like this, initiatives, is there really room for a European model? Why should the European model prevail? And if it does prevail, does I wish it, it did because I'm a big fan of, of Europe and of its values that, are, uh, that root it. So, uh, but uh, I don't know what in this proposal will be, so I don't even know whether that will be a good model that we just came up with or that we're coming up with. But why in, 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 I've seen this immense proliferation of AI-related initiatives, why would the European model prevail or have a leading role? And is it just because we're the first one to regulate? And in this sense, I don't think that being the first necessarily is something so uh, uh, relevant beyond the political claim that you're trying to make. I am the first one, so I have been ahead of others. I think it's much more relevant to get it actually right. And so maybe uh, some further consideration is required. So for instance, in, in the case of liability, I'm a bit, a bit skeptical about uh, a technology neutral approach that seems to be prevailing, and I'm much more in favor of a technology specific approach. We saw it with Germany, for instance. They were the first one to adopt specific regulation on driverless cars. I doubt that the best regulation possible for driverless car is the German uh, uh, currently enacted proposal, and I think it works simply because there are not so many driverless cars circulating on any German roads or elsewhere in the world. So, being the first to regulate, is this what uh, key to the European success or the success of the European way of doing things in this global dimension, global competition, or is there something else? What do you think? Thanks for the question. If I may, Natalie, and um, briefly, I, I think that um, it's important to be first because Europe has this idea that that uh, there should be this ethical side to um, to the, the the applications of these technologies and 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 to the regulation. So in that sense, I think it's important that um, that you you know I think it's an opportunity for Europe to set an example to to regulate AI. Uh, in a way that deals with ethical and, and societal risks. So I'm very, very happy with that. Um, I don't know about the precise content because uh, for some reason they didn't think it's necessary to inform the members of the high level expert group directly about uh, this regulation that comes. Uh, but I'm very happy to hear that it, that it will be there. And uh, I, I think that Europe uh, in this playing field between uh, U.S. And, and China, that it can play the role of um, setting, setting ethical standards and, and, and making a, a regulatory framework that, that's neither um, very uh, tight, like in China, um, very um, restrictive, 
uh, nor uh, very laissez-faire like in the US. So I think it's, there's a lot of um, room for Europe to, to do something there that, that many other countries are looking at and, and will follow. Um, but I agree with you that, that it's important to get it right. Um, uh, and for that, it's, it's, uh, it's good to remind ourselves that uh, regulation is not something that's uh, an eternal kind of thing. And, and in, in my view, it should always be, be flexible in the sense that if we, if we see that it uh, doesn't work the way we want, if we uh, see the disadvantages after a while, that we can also uh, steer, steer it uh, in a direction where we want it to be. Um, and I, I hope that's possible within the ecosystem of the European Commission and, and the other um, institutions of the European Union. Yes, that's, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, I, I agree. I, I like to say that regulation is not a battle, it's a war. So you don't fight it just once, but you fight it over and over again until you get it right and basically until the end. So whenever you create new regulation, you also should be open for, for uh, 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 the possibility of the need to amend it and to modify it over time. I'm just a bit skeptical that Right now, so many things about AI could, could be uh, so, you know, systematically solved, like regulation typically requires. But I'm very, I'm very curious to see what the what the Commission will bring out. I think there will be huge attention uh, uh, on that. So uh, I don't know if, if Natalie has a comment on what I what I asked. Mm -hmm. I would like to hear her position as well, if she, if she has. Have yes. <laughs> Um, I, I would expect that. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, few... Andrea has this privilege. Thank you. There's a, a few things there. I think, first of all, I, I use it myself, the term, but I don't really like the term regulating AI, because what are we talking about? Are we talking about regulating, first of all, which of the AI technologies? Are we talking about regulating the fact that they can be uh, biased and discriminative and that we want verification? Are we talking about regulating their use in a certain context, sector? So it's very broad. And then liability regime around AI is something very different than setting up, for instance, rules of transparency around AI. So it's very difficult, I think, to talk about regulation of AI in a catch-all. Even though, uh, and I have not seen the regulation, but I understand that uh, the idea of the upcoming proposal for regulation will be indeed to cover a lot of various things. Um, falling under the AI regulation umbrella. So that remains to be seen. I think, um, of course, it should not just be about being the first one to regulate AI. Um, although I do believe, and, as, and when we had a discussion about that um, previously, that there might be a competitive advantage, a first mover advantage. If you come up with regulation, you set your rules, and the others become rule takers while you're the rule maker. You need to have sufficient economic power to do that, um, to pull that off, but potentially that can be the case for Europe. And of course, it's important to get it right. But um, I think we should also, and that's where it becomes important what we are talking about for some uses of AI, for some uh, context in which it is used, we also need to think what happens if we get it wrong and we don't do anything about it. Because let's be clear, this is just a proposal proposed by the European Commission and then it will go to the council and the parliament and there will be lobby around it. I mean, it's not like this regulation will kick in even this year, if we're lucky next year or the year after. So we're still far off an actual AI regulation and then there will be a transition period for people to adapt. So, and for some things, I do think that there is no time to lose. And I will take the opportunity to link now to the question that was asked by Gianluigi, uh, our, our uh, chair, uh, and, and try to link it to that. It, it depends, of, of course, of what you, what you talk about when you say regulating AI. But um, in some instances, um, this is not about making an analogy like regulating health or regulating forests or regulating trade. Um, because the way AI can be used, uh, and, and I say can be because not necessarily, it affects um, not just individuals, as I tried to explain, but society at large. And with that, I mean also basically the physical infrastructure of society, but also the mental infrastructure of society, the way we think, the way we value things individually, but also at the societal level. 
And so I'm not saying that with one AI regulation uh, that you sweep up uh, like that, you will tackle that, but it's incredibly important to be aware of that and to think about where we want to go with our mental and physical infrastructure of our society. And some of the things that will be in this regulation deal with values like equality, um, deal with values like transparency and accountability. And these are important. Uh, the rule of law, the impact on democracy. And we need to, I think, still have a lot of work to bring these abstract terms to a more concrete level and also to, to try to pinpoint more concretely how AI can affect them. Because it's very difficult to say AI uh, affects the digital infrastructure of society. What does that mean, right? Where does that happen? But this is because it's the accumulative effect. It's not one AI system. It's the range of AI systems in a range of societal domains that accumulately brings this uh, systematic harm, right? Systemic harm, if you like. And this is what we need to try to tackle. And this is not easy to do. And I don't know if Europe will manage to do it, but we have to do it. And there I'm back with my manifesto probably, so I'll, I'll stop here. No, no, you are right. Uh, if I if I may say uh, one word, uh, yes, it's true. I mean, you, you reminded me of something that I wish to say. Um, well, just uh, an observation, first of all, concerning the problem of sovereignty, of local sovereignties, autonomy, self-government and local government vis-a-vis -vis global uh, well, regulation and so forth. I, I was wondering whether these questions are real questions. And uh, in other words, if uh, is this thing, you know, that kind of sanity one century ago, still something available? Is real something that we think possible and real in the realm of uh, uh, present process uh, in our societies? We are already pervaded. We are already interconnected. We are already whatever we think or we do, uh, this is, uh, well, everything is going to pierce the veil of our states. Uh, therefore, we don't have that option. We have to reconsider our sovereignty in conditional terms and in very more modern contemporary terms. So, well, it, it is better we do not go back again uh, thinking through uh, old categories sometimes is good and sometimes is bad and i believe this time is bad and uh, and you uh, natalie you reminded me this problem what does it mean to cope with systemic problems and in fact i agree that it is not just uh, well in my question there was underneath this uh, this conundrum. Uh, it's, it's a systemic. When we speak about artificial intelligence, it's pervading everything. It's a systemic, not an ad hoc regulation. Like, and you, you caught perfectly uh, what I was thinking about. And uh, well, if I may suggest, uh, a few years ago, well, 10, uh, Zabel and Zeitl published some uh, analytical studies praising the European experimental mode of governance. That was uh, a novelty, especially seen from the United States. It is something tackling systemic problems. Uh, a kind of experimental governance that was already spreading in the ways of governance of the European Union, and that they praised because it used uh, 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 talking with interested uh, stakeholders and learning process, trial and error, revise, revisions, revisabilities, and so forth. And this is the only way, I think, also for artificial intelligence, and not that kind of top-down regulation that, of course, is sector-related, that is insufficient and ideologically opposing what we are you especially are in uh, today with artificial intelligence. So for what concerns myself, I am very happy to, uh, to have been hearing uh, your presentations. I don't know if uh, uh, the, 
the organizer Andrea Bertolini will allow us now to conclude this panel and uh, perhaps to conclude uh, the conference as a whole. So I, I ask him if I can say hello to everyone and thank you everyone. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Palombella. And um, it was indeed a very interesting discussion, as we said, last but not least, actually. Uh, um, and, and, and yes, unfortunately, it is my um, honor and also duty uh, to uh, bring this uh, very interesting today's debate and conference on regulating uncertainty to its natural end. All nice things have to come to an end. But I would like to draw on two of the last statements that we heard during this panel that are at least uh, in terms of uh, uh, wishes, being myself uh, an, an enthusiast European citizen, I do really hope that Europe will be a rule maker and not a rule taker in this very fundamental field of that is of the regulation, I would say, of advanced technologies. And the second one, that we will get it right, because that is of essential importance for European enterprises, for uh, uh, European researchers, and above all, European citizens and society. So with this hope, I say hello to and goodbye to all of you. I thank you for being with us for this very interesting and stimulating two days debate. And I hope that next year we will be able to welcome all of you, or at least some of you in person, and have the rest connected from all over the world where you are. So please be in touch. You can always reach us via email. You can monitor our uh, uh, website, www.eura.santanapisa.it. And uh, you can also, uh, uh, you will also be able in a few days' time to see this, uh, uh, the recording of this event on our YouTube channel should you want to go back to some presentations. But for the moment, enjoy your evening and enjoy your weekend ahead. And see you soon. Thank you.